Will, um, I can make somebody a co-host as well as making you the host who would? I guess Susan. Okay. We need a co-host. Want to make me the co-host? Uh, only if you want to. Um, that's fine. I'm usually actually, okay, I'll do it. No problem. I don't, I don't think I even usually have one, but if we need one. It's a good practice. Okay. Keeps you, uh, keeps your uh, focus free. Great. All right, let's get going. It's 632. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the April meeting for CB2's Quality of Life Committee. Um, many of you, I'm sure, have attended before, and you know that we cover a wide range of topics, uh, including but not limited to street activities, environmental topics, sanitation, um, and others. Uh, so today we have a very street activity focused meeting. Um, we have 11, I believe, street activity applications to review. Um, as a reminder, the way the process usually will work is I will call each street event uh, according to the order that we have it on the agenda. Um, if you are here representing that event, please raise your hand. We will then have a brief description of the event from the applicant. Um, by the way, if, if you have any kind of slides or graphics which outline um, what your event looks like and you want to uh, display them, we would really appreciate that. I put my email in the chat. You can just email them to me and I'll display it as you're presenting. Um, so we'll have a brief presentation from each event. Then we will have the opportunity for committee members to ask questions. Then we'll give the opportunity for other CB2 members to ask questions. Uh, and then we'll give the opportunity for members of the public to ask questions. Um, I, as, as many of you know, I like to give everybody a chance to ask their questions, but I do ask that today, just given our long schedule, um, please keep them brief and to the point. Um, and if you've already heard someone ask a question, let's try not to repeat the same question. Um, and I think that covers it. And then following, you know, once all 11 street activities have been presented, um, we'll then go into business session. Uh, which at that point will just be the committee um, debating resolutions on each event, uh, and then we'll no longer take questions at that point. So um, let me give a brief introduction of the committee here, and then we'll get started. So I'm William Benish. I'm the chair of the Quality of Life Committee. Um, it looks like we have our full committee here today. So we have Susan Kent, who is the CB2 chair and a member of this committee. Um, we have Rocio Sands, a member of this committee. Michael Levine, a member of this committee, Zachary Roberts, a committee member, Brian Pape, committee member, um, and Wayne Kowadler, committee member. And then we also have Joanna Lawton here, who is our public member. Um, and it looks like we have Carter Booth here as well, uh, who is a CB2 member and former chair. Um, so without further ado, I think that covers the introductions and process. So let's move on to our first event. Um, the first event on the agenda is the 420 street closure event. That's April 20th. Uh, that's the sponsors, the House of Cannabis, April 20th, Howard Street between Broadway and Mercer. Um, so if you're here for that application, please raise your hand. See Golda. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and promote you to panelist. Actually, if you could accept that, Golda. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hi, Golda. Thanks for thanks for joining. Um, there's a few other people with their hand raised. Um, do you have others that are here? Yeah, with I you? think Robert, uh, the owner, might be on the call as well. Robert, I just promoted you as well. And I would ask just, for, this goes for all the applications. Um, if you have the ability to turn your camera on, we, we would appreciate it. So, hey, Robert, thanks for joining. Hi, how are you? Good. So you have three of us here. You have Tim Harrell. I don't. 
And Hi, Tim. Karina, Tim is head of global security and Anthony is the vice president of operations for THC NYC. Great. And uh, Golda, you're, are you with the production company? Uh, I'm with THC as well. With the oh, you're with Canada. THC as well. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. So why don't you kick it off um, by giving just an overview of what you're looking to do, and then we'll move on to, you know, just asking some questions. Sure. You want to put the screen on? Sure. So we're, uh, we're attempting to, we'd like to close off Howard Street between... Broadway and Mercer to have an event from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. And you'll see adding the site map to the screen if I can figure it out. That doesn't like it. It should be enabled for hosts and panelists to share. So it should work, but if it doesn't work- I think our, it Zoom, so our Zoom setting is uh, where we have to tell the Mac to tell us we can share the screen. Okay. Just one second. If it's easier, you can also just email it to me and I'll share it. All right, let's do that. Perfect. All right, what's your email? I, I put it in the chat, uh, it's in the will, chat but it's company. my name, just my name at Gmail, William.Benish at Gmail. And while, yeah, but you can go ahead and get started while that's coming through. Okay. So you said 1 p.m. Yeah, so it uh, starts at 1, finishes at 6. We're going to have vendor booths. Um, we have the city is sending their uh, mobile uh, small business uh, vehicle. We're going to have uh, areas. I think a law firm is setting up an area. We're having other uh, sponsor vendors take spaces. We're going to have a food truck. We have an area for porta potties. You know, I'll have um, Tim go through the security. So with the um, as far as the, the street vendors, um, there will be 10 to 12 security for the street, as well as fire guards with the um, FO4 requirement classification as per FDMY. Okay. I'm sending that through just now. All right, so you should be able to pull okay. it up now and kind of give you a layout of how we want to set it up. And the idea is that this block party goes from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. Um, so it's kind of a midday block party um, with informational booths, vendors, food trucks, security. We, we certainly want everyone to be safe um, and to have restrooms. We also are planning on bringing in um, essentially receptacle cans. So we'll, we'll hire a city waste who's our vendor that does our waste management to bring in receptacles so that the streets remain clean. Um, we will staff our porters to ensure that the, the streets also remain clean throughout the, the event. Um, and then there is, as you, if you've gotten the email just yet, William. Yeah, um, give me, just give me a second. I'll, I'll show it. Perfect. Um, there is a security booth, naturally. Um, we, we have a lane for egress for emergency, just in case anything should happen or someone is uh, inhibited. Uh, yeah, and then our venue is adjacent to it. So ideally, we get people to see our, our business and, and add some color to the neighborhood as well. Can you talk about, um, well, first of all, so are, is the concept of a stage and live music now, has that been taken out? We're not necessarily, we're not having a stage. We're having a, a Red Bull vehicle that had, that plays music. They're one of the sponsors. So it's kind of like um, a truck that that's capable of emitting uh, a music. It has two speakers on it. Yeah, it's a self-contained um, Red Bull vehicle. Essentially it's self-powered, um, self-generated power. Okay. And then there's a AV system in it, it doesn't look like it's actually on this um, layout. But yes, we, we do intend to have that for DJs throughout the space, throughout the day. Okay, but um, there's not going to be a live performer as was, you know, in the original application was something you guys were looking at. And I think that was one of my big concerns. Yeah, for, for us, really, li live performer would be a single um, MC or vocalist. If anything, that 
that is with a DJ. So not like a full band or anything like that. Just the DJ uh, set by a, a live performer. And we may have one or two guests stop by and do something, but it's not going to be a full performance. Yeah, I, I think my biggest it's not going to be a promoted performance. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think my biggest outside. concern though would be any. Uh, you know, I'm worried about the size of this block and anything last minute with someone who has an Instagram following or it's known on social media could still contribute to a lot of people moving into the block uh, last minute. So I think we'd want to see some essentially a commitment to not having any kind of live performance mainly from a security perspective is is the biggest worry so we can with with that we can um actually speak to the management and make sure that they do not post no one posts as far as instagram as far as a lot of live performance um we've had that happen once before and once we let them know not to go um post anything regarding their location or or a live performance it normally does happen who's who's the management company meaning management in terms of like, is any, like you said you'd speak to the management fire. company is, is is that who are you referring to no i'm saying like if say for instance an artist decides to okay come by and, and show up we'll speak with their manager immediately to let them know not to post anything on instagram on their location, noting that they're doing a live performance on the block. Okay. I'm still not sure I'm comfortable with that, but um, you know, we can we can move on. Um, as far as setup and breakdown, what what are your current plans? Yeah, I mean the the permit is a 12 hour permit, so we we look to host one to six. Um, we we'll want to get. The majority of kind of the porta potties and the receptive trash receptacles in first, um, and then some steel barricades just for safety again for egress lane. Um, we do have a timeline. Let me see if I can pull it up. It was in the application as well for run a show. Let me pull this up. Um, we would like to start at 7 a.m. load in again, soft load in. This is when our security would arrive. Um, to set up street cones, to reserve just the spaces. As you know, people park on the street. So we want to make sure that no one's trapped in there. Um, and that's when we would set up the barricades and the security booth. At uh, 9 a.m. is when we would plan to bring the trash receptacles in. At 9.30, we'd plan to bring the porta potties in to 10. Um, at 10 to 10.30, we'd bring in the vendor booths. Um, and then 10.30 to 11, so we bifurcate, you know, the, the different amounts of information booths that come in. And then uh, from 12, we would be show ready, if you will. So we're ready for people to kind of come and they're going to be curious, but we'll have staff um, front of house and security ready to go by noon, even though we have a 1 p.m. kickoff. Yeah. Are there going to be any kind of barriers on either side of the block or is it going to just be open? Yeah, no, we don't plan on kind of enclosing the block. Um, we do want kind of pass through, but I, I do think that the security lane, we would potentially figure out um, kind of tiered barriers throughout. So not a full line directly down the center of the street, but enough to kind of naturally segment the street. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh I mean, I'm sorry to keep coming back to this, but let, let me pose a hypothetical for you and just see how this would be handled. So say you have some kind of well-known performer who you don't know is coming yet, but decides within the next 10 days that they want to show up and uh, either partner with the DJ or whatever that you mentioned. You tell them not to post it on social media, but clearly as soon as someone sees them there, uh, as soon as members of the public see them there, they'll start posting on their social media, word spreads. Uh, and say you end up in a scenario where you now have thousands of people trying to come see this, like what, what do you do in that scenario? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think naturally we'll overstock steel barricades. We plan on bringing a hefty amount of security into the space because safety is, you know, paramount in these sort of scenarios. Really, again, traffic, we're trying to drive to the museum, right? So, so we're really trying to pull some of the crowd into the space, into the museum, 
um, which is a non-selling, we're not a dispensary, we're simply exploring the world of cannabis in, in fun and interactive ways. So really the goal is to get people on the street so that they then immerse themselves into our museum. Um, but yeah, we'll have additional steel barricades on the side, which you naturally have in these scenarios. If we find out that there's a leak, we'll be monitoring social media all day. So if we find out there's a leak, we can add extra steel barricades up, in which case we may want to block the street off, right? As long as everyone's aware of that, we may be blocking the street off if we see that kind of throughput. Um, but yeah, we'll have at least 20 security guards around the business during that time um, and sufficient steel barricade. And we'll coordinate with the um, PD, the local NCO and first precinct as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've been in contact with the first precinct just in general, you know, being good neighbors, understanding that this is a hot topic and, you know, we want to respect the neighbors and, and be respectful of the space and create a safe environment for everyone. So, you know, we're proactive in that relationship as well. Um. All right, let, let me give some other people a chance to speak here. Because um, I, uh, let me see if I can stop the share. Okay. Um, let's go back, let's go to members of the committee. Uh, Michael? Yes, I, um, I'd like to back up for one second from your excellent presentation and ask you two questions. Number one, what is the event or activity that this block party is celebrating, announcing or promoting? That's number one. And number two, you mentioned vendors, you mentioned booths, you mentioned the city of New York will have a booth. What is the relationship of the vendors and the city of New York to your organization? And what is it exactly that is being promoted by way of this block party? Yeah, um, first question, uh, first, the answer to the question is we are a cannabis museum and 420 is a cannabis related event, if you will. Um, so it is about finding a demographic of people who are early adopters in our business model um, to gather around our space. And a little bit more about our space is, is as I pointed out earlier, we're not a dispensary. So, you know, we tackle things like social um, reform, social injustices around um, cannabis crimes. We are a platform for dialogue around education, around the benefits of cannabis and its um, medicinal impact. So we're, we're not really only about cannabis as a recreational, um, you know, use. We're talking about different modalities in the world of cannabis. So ideally we gather people safely in a space um, to then engage them in our business model and get them used to our experience. So, so the second part of your question is yes. uh, Dashita Dawson, uh, who's in charge of, I think she's the yes. city liaison for the mayor and the cannabis, um, crafting the mayor's cannabis policy. She's bringing, it's called the Moby Mobile. And it's a New York Small Business Services and they give out pamphlets encouraging people to sign up for small businesses. But then what are the other, how are the other vendors bringing booths selected? What is your criteria? Well, I think people uh, in and around the cannabis environment, uh, whether it's legal, uh, you know, a couple of dispensaries passing out flyers of where they're located, uh, services that are offered. Uh, we've asked, um, you know, people that have community-based programs want to have a place to give out their pamphlets. So the preference would be for our community, is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Rocio? Yeah, I have questions, a couple of questions. Um, the vendor booths, you just said that they would be just distributing literature, basically, right? Promoting their places of business. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, you also said hefty security, and then you mentioned a number 20 security guards and metal barricades. So if, as we said just a few minutes ago, if there are a lot of people, all of a sudden you get thousands of people coming because they heard somebody famous is going to be performing or is performing. Do you think that 20, that's hefty, is 20 security guards is going to be enough to take care of this potential influx of people coming to this block. That's number one. And number two, uh, you talk about 
um, educating the people? Are, are you considering also educating people about the detriment of, of cannabis and what are long-term effects on people's health and about smoking, uh, which is, they keep telling us smoking is bad for us, really? right? You can't smoke, it's very bad for your lungs. Well, what about smoking cannabis? Is that good for your lungs? Can you explain a little bit of that to me, please? Well, sure, I'm not a doctor, but I think a lot of, for example, my mother had uh, ovarian cancer when I was 15 years old and she turned to cannabis because they gave her three months to live and she's now 86, has been using the product for almost uh, 60 years. So I think it's an individual choice. It is legal to consume in, in, uh, in New York City. We don't condone or, or encourage the use of cannabis. We just show how it influences on a cultural basis. Um, and so there are other people that take it medically, whether it's through tinctures or, or edibles or gummies and things like that. So we don't, we don't, it's not for us to tell people whether they should use cannabis or not. What about the detrimental part? Same, I mean, I, I don't, uh, you know, George Spurn smoked a cigar every day for a hundred years. So I, I'm not, uh, you know, we, we're not involved in, in telling individuals how they should live their life. I think, and I think there was a security question. I mean, is the is there any chance you'll have more than twenty, or is that kind of the max? Yeah, I mean, to go back to the relationship with the first precinct again, we're very close with the first precinct, and we we are keeping them beat by beat on any sort of event or occasion that we intend to celebrate. So I think there's going to be a relationship there that is very important to this dialogue. Um, and yeah, of course, if we feel like they're is heavy traction, there's potential to grow that number. Okay. It's not, yeah, it's, it, yeah. Brian, it's not a significant no. okay. size block. So I think, you know, again, to containing it to the space, um, that's a, a fairly large number with, with double barricades. Brian? Yeah, thank you for the presentation and thank you for the tour of the museum and uh, it's really exciting and uh, very fascinating to see something like that being developed so early on in the legalization of the recreational use and I was wondering if um, I don't remember being talked about uh, contacting the neighbors and uh, what kind of feedback has been gotten from the neighbors so there is one residential area on um, two doors down from us. And so it's, uh, you know, we're, we sit on the corner, then you have stadium good, you have the skateboard shop, and then you have a building. So I stood out and introduced myself to as many members as I could meet and tell them, you know, what we are and where we're coming from. Uh, last night, I got an email, I think, from one of the committee members, you know, highlighting the different uh, community boards. So it was almost too late to reach out to them uh, before today's meeting. So did you get much feedback on, from the residences? At the end? They were fine. You know, I think they were appreciative. We were closing fairly early. I mean, we could start, you know, lowering the music at uh, 530. I mean, we say six, but I mean, you know, after 420, I think a lot of people will, uh, will, will kind of dissipate. Thank you. Susan? Thanks. Um, Sort of to follow up, Michael had asked about what the um, sort of the purpose behind this event was. Now, it's my understanding that this celebrates the opening of the museum. Is this something, though, that you plan on doing on an annual basis, or is this really just connected to the opening? You know, I think we'll see, uh, you know, obviously we're doing the first one, uh, hopefully, and then uh, we'll see how it goes from there. I don't think it's necessary we do it every year, but we'll see how this one goes and take it from there. And as a, a, a second question, um, have you calculated your maximum, what the maximum um, sort of occupancy of the block would be? And do you have, is there a plan in place in terms of turning people away or do you envision that you might, you know, exceed a maximum that will require that? You know, I was on a block party that Stadium and Goods did and they did between two and 3,000 people because not everybody stayed. 
So a lot of people came, saw and left. So I don't think it's, you know, it's not like an all day party. So I think some people look, come in, see it and then leave, right? There's not a thousand things to do. So I don't think it's one of these things where people come at one and they stay till six. I think you'll get a lot of people to peruse through and then they'll go on their way for the day. They might stand out, go amongst the booths, maybe grab something from the food truck and go on their way. I don't, I don't think it's something that you're going to get massive amounts of people standing there all day from one to six. Oh, I, I would agree with that. My concern most specifically is that you would have a, a period of surge connected to a performance. And that is what might push you over this expected number. Yeah, we're not gonna we're not gonna set any times or do anything to 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 lead people. We're not announcing anything. So um, you know, there's no reason for anyone to stand around. I think, you know, the busiest time is probably obviously 420, right? Because that's what the, what the holiday was based on. And to give you a little background, why it's called 420, there was six friends uh, that met in Northern California underneath a clock tower at 420, allegedly. They, you know, you can go on the internet and do some research. And they met every day at 420. And then the urban legend turned it into this national holiday in 420. I believe there's 20 five plus events around New York City that day, maybe more. Way more. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Maybe more, maybe 50 to 100, yeah, right? Yeah. And even the day before on 419, there's events. On 421, I know there's events. So, uh, you know, it's, it's just what it's become all, all, all across America. But, but I mean, to your point of kind of managing occupancy, like we'll certainly have a, a finger on the pulse there. Um, as we talked about a security booth, we'll be on walkies, there'll be people stationed at both sides of the street, both Mercer and Broadway. Um, so we will certainly have eyes. Uh, we have clickers as well. So naturally, we're going to see kind of a flow um, to, to Robert's point, a transient flow throughout the day. We imagine kind of a smorgasbord, if you will, if you've ever been to the Williamsburg smorgasbord, people pop in, they check out the booths, they grab a bite to eat. And ideally, they stay around for the music for 10 minutes and then continue on their way. Um, so really for us, again, to your to your original point, it's about exposure to our business and and ideally finding some footing in the neighborhood uh, with with the people who are early adopters of our model. Thank you. Yeah, I guess uh, I'll, I'll open it up to other people in a second, but I guess sort of pulling all that together. I would maybe just ask a rhetorical question. I mean, this is, you're a brand new institution. You're a new cultural institution in the neighborhood. You want people to get to know you. You want the neighbors to get to know you well. You want people in the neighborhood to become members, all of this, right? Why not keep it an educational event that would appeal to people who can come by, learn more about you? And why sort of flirt with this concept of maybe having it turn into a party with a performer? I'm just not sure how it, how that fits with the educational component, I guess, of what you're trying to do. So uh, it's more of a rhetorical question, but that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. Yeah, but there's no, it's not like a beer garden, right? So it's not like people getting drunk or, or doing anything. I mean, it's not like, um, you know, it's a street fair. It's not like, you know, people are going to go crazy and, you know, there's going to be people jam jumping up and down and dancing and all that kind of stuff. It's very tame. Um, it's not, uh, you know, something that... I I would agree with you 100% on every aspect of it, except for the concept of a possible performer, and in which case I think people would probably get into it if it's a well-known performer in terms of jumping and, and crowding and all that. Yeah, and I mean, I guess to the earlier point of not, th there's going to be no public facing run a show, there will be no kind of posting that there's a premium performer, um, this isn't something that we're we're equally invested in it not being chaotic, right? Because our business is right next door to it. So we have gla beautiful glass facade windows. We don't want people to run into those. We don't want it to get chaotic on, on the property either. Um, and we're new neighbors. So we do want to respect the neighborhood as well. Yeah. Um, we have Rocio and then Michael. Uh, okay, so have you done this before on um, this kind of fair? Have you had it? Um, I've done it not in in New York, but I've been involved in in outside uh, performances and things like that. Where? In Las Vegas. Not in New York. Not in New York, yes, ma'am. Okay, is there a price um, of admission to enter the museum? Uh, 
A Tiananmen Museum, yes. So may I suggest perhaps instead of using the street, which could get really chaotic, maybe this uh, party should be held or well, the street fair should be inside the museum. Well, Free to all who want to attend. So this way, they'll still know who you are. They'll get to know. They'll see what's going on inside. And then they'll come back and see the rest of it. Just if a I suggestion. Could, if I could just jump in here to, to the to the performance. Um, we're, it's really, we're not having a performance. This kind of model of event has been done in California and many other places. And it's it's really a very calm event. And when we mean we're going to have a celebrity performance, it's really someone just walking through for really, for, for us, it's really just like a marketing aspect where we can have a lot of content done around that and having a celebrity come there literally for, you know, five to 10 minutes, right around 420 and just, you know, shout out 420. Um, again, we haven't really done a lot of advertising because we're still waiting for the permit and we're 10 days away from it. So we really don't see a lot of, you know, surge and a lot of people, again, we're competing with 25, you know, 420 events around the area. Um, so obviously we understand, you know, the concern is the performance, but I just want to stress that it's not a big, you know, performance. I believe the major event is at Washington Square Park. They have 25,000 people or something exactly. squared up for that. Right. Yeah, and likely won't be on the nose 420. Like that's that's fairly predictable. So to the point of being uh, austere, right? Like I think we're, we want to be not so on the nose in that sense if we are going to do maybe a celebrity in that sense. Okay, uh, I think Michael, you have your hand? Yes, up? I have. Yes, thank you. I have one follow-up question. Uh, are you a for-profit business? You keep using the expression your business. But I was under the impression you were a nonprofit institution. Can you tell us, just so that we know what we're dealing with, what are you, nonprofit or a for-profit business? We, we are a for-profit business. Okay, so, so thank you. Okay. Um, all right, I've, I've definitely spoken enough. Um, Let's uh, let's see. Uh, any other board members have questions? Carter Booth has his hand raised. Hey, thanks, guys. So I, I'm I'm sort of confused. Are you going to allow performers or not? Are there going to be any celebrity appearances or not? Because both of them, you sort of been cagey with the answers, and it would just be helpful if there's clarity. We may have one one person pop in and say hi, and do you know say hi to the crowd. Okay, and then, and as far as is smoking outside, I mean, I don't think that you can allow smoking during a street closure because you're you're not allowed to do it under city run events. Is my understanding? Are you guys? What are you guys going to do about that? What's the plan? Um, I was in the assumption people are allowed to smoke in New York. Um, I mean, just I don't think that when you know, there's an organized event where it becomes city run or under the jurisdiction of somebody that smoking's allowed, just like in a bar or restaurant, you know, any any it's, type of those events, smoking's not allowed in parks. I mean, that's true that people can smoke out on the street, but this is now your event and people are under your responsibility and they're consuming on grounds that you control a pro with product that you haven't provided that's regulated. Yeah, I mean, I was under the impression that that wasn't a regulation that would impact this particular event as well, being that it is outdoors and it is state um, regulated as legal. Would you suggest? Right, but, 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 but it's state regulated as legal, but that's in specifically prescribed ways for selling it and using it. Now this is a for-profit endeavor where you're sponsoring an event where people are- But where this, this event, one second, please. This event is not for profit, it's free. Yeah, we're not charging people to come to the event. Oh, no, no, no. You're a for-profit entity promoting your business. Mm -hmm. So uh, on grounds, just as much as anybody who had alcohol or anything else would need to get a license. Uh, we, do you suggest we just- 
recommend pe- or we tell people not to smoke, we can have security. Well, I don't know. I mean, my understanding is you're already letting people smoke inside your museum, which is also illegal. No, we're not. We're not allowing people to smoke. That is not, that is not true. Okay. And, and you're also giving away uh you know cannabis in the we're not we don't we don't touch the plant no, no yeah no, i mean that's not i mean you can see on social media that that's not the case because people uh, are promoting events where they're giving away stuff there have been celebrities that have been smoking inside so i'm I'm just confused because those the you know those are some of the things that i'm just curious outside you know and the reason i bring this up is that you know Counterculture, which is generally a nonprofit, you know, we're home to one of the organizations that's promoted legalization of cannabis for decades. And that's the Yippies. And, you know, they were located on Bleecker Street for decades. And, you know, I don't know if there's anything there. The same thing when you mentioned Washington Square Park, that's counterculture. It's not for profit, it's not somebody making money, that's advocacy work. And so now, that it's legal, you know, obviously there's some framework. And I mean, you know, it's just like with the dram shop laws, if you're allowing somebody to smoke on under your area that you have under your control and you're observing it and watching it and they go leave and they get in an accident, you know, who's responsible in that respect? If it's on a public city street, that's different, but you guys are the ones who are frameworking that and it's under an area that you're running so i I mean this is an unexplored area that's why i have those questions but you know obviously that's a reason that it's regulated and um and and so i just not sure where how the for-profit fits in for a for-profit entity having something where people are inviting people to come and consume under their direction how that figures in um and as far as i mean the neighbors it it sounds like the neighbors reached out to you not the other way around is that fair uh no i didn't have any neighbor reach out to me so how how did that engagement go you said that a neighbor had been in contact with you in the last no i said i stood in front of the only building on the street and introduced myself to a few of the residents that were coming in and out Okay, but you you knew about the residents, so I mean the Broadway Residents Coalition spoke with you when you presented at CB2's meeting. I mean you knew of their existence, but you you didn't go and look at CB2's block association list or go out and reach out to any of the local groups. I did not. As a, I got the list last night, so I did not today. Correct. Well, I mean when you were when you were pursuing your liquor license last year, I mean those groups are all all existed at that point. Right. I mean, I people spoke at it. I mean, it's not like it was a mystery. Um, and 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 this is, you know, from while, you know, in this debate, it's not new to Soho, but I mean, the idea of museum, it's more experiential. Correct. Yes, sir. And and so I, I that's where I am just confused as as far as. All right. So going forward, I'll call it an experience, not a museum. Well, no, no, I'm just confused because of, of of a lot of it. It just seems to be marketed towards people who are under the influence of cannabis as opposed to the museum. And that's sort of the question that comes. I mean, these are open areas, you know, not to say that you know the answers, but, you know, who's responsible for people who are impaired in their behavior, et cetera. Yeah, I would, I would say just like a bar is, is, you know, responsible for what they serve, a venue is responsible for what they serve, not for what people come in as. So it's how we manage the safety of our guests, which is significant. I ran Photographiska on 22nd and Park. We had a bar, we had a restaurant, we had drinks served throughout the museum, um, and then we had to maintain and we had, you know, inebriation visibility we we looked for guests that were inebriated similarly here we want all guests to be safe so we're going to err on the side of caution for safety um we can certainly tell people not to smoke in the area I, like i'm not a, a abject to that at all i think that's totally fine and i think people will do what they do outside of these you know steel barricades and that's okay but we can certainly manage you know let people know 
we're not to smoke in here. And if we see people lighting up a joint, we could say you can't do that in here. You know, it's it's as simple as that for us from a safety perspective. When you're talking about the museum from an experiential perspective, I think we've done the most um, from a sort of experiential museum. We've partnered with DPA, Drug Policy Alliance, to talk about reform. There's a call to action in one of our spaces. Um, we have an educational room called Terpenes or called Olfactory, where you get to explore kind of the sense of each cannabis strain and what makes it smell a certain way and what makes you feel a certain way. So outside of just like a beautiful, massive record player that you can lay on and watch a light show, I think there are also efforts to destigmatize and or speak to certain qualities of the, the plant that other people might not be aware of. So that's kind of where we teeter on museum or the edification does exist that I don't think like Museum of Ice Cream has or the Slime Museum down the block has. Right, and then, and then you know, just to follow up on, on Rocio, I mean, one of the ar article in the New York Times today was how do you know if you're addicted to weed? And it said nearly 6% of American teens and adults have cannabis use disorder was the headline. So just, you know, maybe personal choice, but obviously there's a portion of the public that does have issues, and uh, just to just to point that out from from uh, her perspective, as far as educational component, it's also responsible use as well. Yeah, completely. Same thing as how do you know you're addicted to hydrocodone or oxycontin, right? Those are medically prescribed drugs that are legal, but people can abuse dosage. And to that point, it's about talking about those things and. And being a platform for that discourse, to, to Robert's point, we're here to, to have the dialogue, and that's part of our business model, to have the dialogue. And I, and I do really appreciate, you know, the other side of the spectrum, because that's part of getting to homeostasis. That's part of kind of getting to even ground. For us, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to speak for, for for Rocio, but that 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 doesn't sound like the answer that was provided to her, which was a little bit different when she had framed her question differently. But um, I will leave it at that. I'm sure there are others you'd like to speak on it. Thank you. Thank you, Carter. I appreciate your uh, following up with this. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there anyone from the public who'd like to speak? Please raise your hand. We have I see, a few. I see, I see three here. Let's uh, ask everyone to please be brief and let's try not to repeat points, but we have four people here, so we'll move through those quickly. Um, Pete, why don't you get started? Hello. Who did you call? You. Go ahead. Okay. Great. Um, yeah, for the committee, uh, this is termed a large street event, which requires a forty-five day in advance um, application. It was submitted to Sapo, received on um, three twenty. Yeah. I saw that, Pete. Yeah. So that's 30 days. The problem is uh, the event is 420. That's the date of the full board meeting. Um, CB2, CBs are supposed to be allowed to chime in with recommendations. Uh, this precludes that unless there is some special, the timing of this event with the late application uh, precludes um, input from CB2 unless there's some special. I, I agree. I, I actually think, I think it should have even been an extra large, which would have been a 60 day. Cause I think there's going to be more than 500 people, but uh, point, point taken. That's um, also the uh, application says the setup will start at 9 a.m. Where we're told today, 7 a.m. Uh, the application says that the advertising will be done by a big social media push. Um, it's already on the website today. Uh, it's already in social media. It's in the press. Uh, and so I am just really concerned that uh, 
This is basically going to be an invitation to the crowds that party at Washington Square Park on 420 to come down to yes, Howard Street. Yes. And, um, okay. I, I think I'm sorry, I'm hearing uh, to just quickly note the 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 setup, the actual setup will we'll start at nine. I said we would arrive at seven for orange cones um for the street parking but the none of the material setup comes in until nine okay and then a question about the porta potty placement uh your diagram shows they will be uh in front of 51 hour which is where the restaurant is located yeah the plan is to put the porta potties next to the street ship uh, I think actually we this diagram was an older one. We were supposed to flip it to the other side of the street. Apologies for that. Well, uh, but the other side of the street is the clearance lane, the fifteen foot clearance. Lane. So you're saying the porta potties will be on the sidewalk? Yes, on the side of the Uh I think we have to retake measurements in this case. Um, Apologies there. Okay, um, whoever's, could somebody mute, please? <laughs> it's like, um, anyway, there's, um, also, SAPO doesn't give a permit until all the other permits are obtained. So I know there's some confusion about that, but no, SAPO gives it first, then we get the others. Well, the SAPO rules clearly state that all other permits must be obtained. DOHMH, NYPD, FDNY, any of those that are uh, connected to the event must be obtained before SAPO will grant a permit. Um, so, um, and the building right next door has residents. It's not just the building with uh, um, La Mercerie uh, on the corner. So welcome to the neighborhood. I think, uh, you know, I know you're new and uh, you're learning, but um, I think this is Rush. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's go to Joanna. Joanna, I see you have your hand raised. Uh, thanks. And sorry if you already covered this. Um, going back to, I think, uh, Carter's question about just monitoring the conditions of other people who might be showing up. Will you have um, water or other, you know, any so anyone keeping track of kind of a, the medical state of needs and access to EMTs or anyone who may need to come in for people fainting or whatever may happen? Totally. We'll, we'll definitely plan on having EMTs on site for this, for sure. Uh, the number we haven't landed on, but 100%. Um, you know, to call back to my most recent experience, I launched Hip Hop 50 at Photographska. We had 2,000 people come through the building um, safely and securely. Um, and we had EMTs on site, a substantial amount of security. Um, you can look that up as well in, in the press. It's a, it's a very prominent event where the mayor attended and Nas was there. So um, that's kind of my pedigree events in, in safety as well. Thank you. Um, all right, we have three more people. Uh, please keep it brief if if, if it's a repeat. Um, we still have 10 other events to do, but um, let's go to Laura. I agree with everything Pete has asked, and um, I appreciate what Carter and Rocio, Rocio said. Um, I think it would be great if we were indoors. And hi, Robert, we met um, when the, the um, Broadway Residents Coalition met with you. It would have been great if you had contacted us about this so that we could speak to other people in the community, but you didn't reach out to us. Um, I, I have some concerns um, just because of the, for a number of reasons. Um, you know, I, I, you've heard me say this ad infinitum, but back in the 90s, I, I was co-chair of this committee, among other committees, and we held three days of public hearings, which were incredibly heated with um, you know, businesses and residents very upset about 
the state of street events. And what came out of that was a set of guidelines which has never been followed. Um, but one of the guidelines actually said not never in Soho. Um, I, I don't, I think that that's something, you know, the horses have gone on that one. But it also said no amplification of noise. And that was a big thing um, because our cast iron buildings reflect noise and absorb noise in a very odd way. And it really terrifies me that there's an intention of having speakers and everything else because I can hear sometimes when people are doing an event on Broadway and I'm a, 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 way, a, a block away from there. Um, it's, it, it, I don't think there should be amplified noise on, on this at any event um, around the area. The other thing that worries me is I don't know if these, the sidewalks are hollow. And one of the things that did happen in the 90s was that a sidewalk did give way underneath some people during a big event, which is one of the reasons that we said not in Soho. Um, I would love it to be looked at to make sure that the sidewalks can handle the weight of the number of people that are expected to walk on, on there. Um, probably the more, you know, the wealthier buildings have done reinforcements and it's safe, but I, I just don't know if it is safe. Um, okay. Do you have a question, Laura? Because we do, I, I, I think the I'm point sorry, about the I'm sorry. Sound is a broader discussion. I'm that you guys want questions now. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to be that you wanted to hear from the community because we had information to give or opinions to give or something like that. I don't specifically have a question to ask, except how are you going to protect the rest of us from having, being able to work, let us be able to work in our homes because it's a work live situation. There are work, it's not only people living on the block who wanna sleep at night, but it's also people living and working on the block who would like to do their art during the day and not be, driven mad by noise. So that's that's my whole issue. How are you going to be protecting the neighborhood? And also one other question, how are you going to make sure that people don't toke up at 4, 420 um, PM, which is what the tradition says to do? Yeah, I mean, and, and to speak to that, we, we certainly want to hear from everyone here. So I hope you don't take that as us saying, is there a question from you? Um, oh, I, I actually I really appreciate that feedback on the sidewalks. That is one of the reasons I put the information booths on the north side sidewalk is because I wanted to keep the pressure off of that sidewalk in front of Cubico. Mm -hmm. uh, and knowing the bedrock in Soho is, is temperamental. Uh, we wanted to keep all of the, the weight towards the street. You'll notice there's kind of a natural barricade of the food trucks and the information booths to kind of keep people more street side, less on the sidewalk. Um, so yeah, I mean, thank you for that feedback as well. Thank you. Um, Darlene? Would you like to speak? Hey, um, thank you, Will. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Darlene Lutz, uh, the Vice President of the First Precinct Community Council uh, speaking in my uh, capacity as uh, connecting to the first precinct and also as a resident, a longtime resident of this area. Um, I think one of the one of the uh, things that I've been hearing from a lot of people over in that over in that part of Soho is that we haven't forgotten uh, how we felt um, by having our neighborhood inundated with a lot of uh, 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 a lot of crowds um, during uh, during COVID uh, that were not controlled. And so uh, the policing and controlling of this is really tantamount. And I'm not exactly understanding the plan. So if you could go over that again, it would be good. Thank you. 
So as far as with the safety, there uh, will be control um, movement as far as in between Mercer and Broadway on Howard, as well as communicating with the first precinct NCO. Um, we do understand your concern and the community's concern about the massive crowds being in the neighborhood, as well as it is, as you guys stated, it is a work day and it's during business hours as well. So we, our plan is to have control um, participants, or as I would say, um, uh, pedestrians coming through the block party to receive informational on um, 420 and regarding the uh, House of Cannabis Museum. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, Darlene. Right, last question, Ronnie, and then we will we will move on because we have many more applications to hear. Hi, uh, my uh, my computer has been freezing, so I hope you'll hear me out. Yes, we hear you. I know, but um, my apartment's one block from the museum, and. Uh, I think we lost. Now it. it's frozen. Can you hear us? Retail, when retail closes, residents remain. It's the energy that both um, entities bring to the area that create the vibrancy, which excites the tourists and shoppers visiting the area. The residents are concerned about the impact of your plans on our community. How will your how will our quality of life be respected? For most of us, this neighborhood is our forever home. Our large historic windows are wonderful for light, but don't keep out sound. The street events you throw will impact our well being. So while you're excited for your future here, we also have invested heavily in our future. When making your plans, it would be reassuring to know that you are concerned how your activities will impact your neighbors. To coexist, remember why you chose Soho. It wasn't just all about the buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. I think we missed the first, you know, maybe the first half of that, but sentiment heard. And, oh. and I'm, I'm still new to the business, so I'm really excited to get to know um, the community members as well. And, and I want to be a direct line for anyone that has any concerns. My email is anthony at thcnyc.com. So I invite emails or questions um, as we do know we're impacting your, your home. So we wanna do that responsibility, responsibly and um, safely. So the street has been closed before and we were able, I'm a block away, we were impacted heavily and we were able to hear everything. So. Just remember, we're here and we're and you liked it here because we're here. So, you know, we have to work with each other. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and we don't plan on kind of blasting music. This isn't like a rave, right? We're, we're just talking about background music for people to enjoy kind of the, the experience. Okay. Uh, look, thanks thanks for coming. Thanks to all the community members who put in their input. We spent an hour on this. I think we heard a lot of debate from the board, from the community. Um, we heard a lot of info from you guys and you you gave us an hour of your time. So thanks so much for coming. Um, thank you. For thank you time. for your time. Gonna, thank you. Okay, um, we're gonna move on. The next event is Malin and Goats, uh, April 22nd. Malin and Goats, NIFTA, Lafayette between Prince and Jersey. David, I see you've raised your hand. Is is that I'm going to promote you? Are you here for that event? Hi, can you hear me? Hi, David. Yes. Hi, William. How's it going, everyone? Good. Thank you for joining. Thank you for having me. Thank you for for taking the time. Um, I I sent over an email with a picture reference. Um to your okay. email. Give me a second. No problem. Great. 
I see it here. All right, let me see if I can share. You can get going if you'd like, and I'll, sure. I'll share. Um, so, you know, just to give a little background on myself, my name is David. I work for the New York Food Truck Association, uh, where we help a lot of different, you know, small businesses and mom and pop food trucks get other events and, and really, you know, help them grow in their communities as well. Uh, part of the services that we offer, and this is the event today, is for other brands to, you know, take over some of these carts and brand them like you're seeing here, um, to have a small pop-up moment uh, somewhere in the city. Um, so this is a similar, obviously it's a different brand that we're speaking about now for the permit, uh, but it'll be a similar footprint to what you see here. It'll be a little food cart that you would normally see on the sidewalk. Um, and it would be fully branded in Malin and Getz, which is um, like a skincare brand. Um, so they have a lot of different products, um, you know, for uh, taking care of your body and your skin. And they will be doing a small sampling, um, giving away free products for people to kind of learn more about the brand that doesn't know it and um, to also give them some free samples. Uh, it will be on the corner of Lafayette and Prince Street. Uh, so we've done a lot of similar events in Soho in this area. So we're well aware of, of the sidewalks and how narrow they are. So for this, we're getting a permit so it can be uh, in the street. So it won't be on the sidewalk. Um, it'll be right in the street. So not like this photo where it's on the sidewalk. This one will be right in the street next to the sidewalk. Um, we have staff like you see in the photo that all they're really doing is there for line management, making sure that we still have plenty of space for pedestrians to walk by. And for those that want to participate in the experience and, you know, have a free sample um, and learn a little bit about the brand, there will be a smooth kind of line and people managing that line to have them walk, get a free sample, and then uh, keep walking. Um, we'll also have any, tra you know, a trash can or two nearby that we uh, take with us back to our facility at the end of the day for, um, you know, any trash that might be disposed. Um, this will be for uh, April 22nd and 23rd. Um, and from the hours of about 10 to four or so. Um, so that's, you know, pretty much it. I'll open it up, you know, to questions and thank you again, you know, for taking the time to review this. Got it. Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah. I see it is 22nd to the 23rd. So we did have, we had that wrong in our agenda. Um, okay. So it's two days, 10, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. each day. And, and, and I'm sorry if I missed it. Are you, giving out both food and branded skincare, or is it just branded skincare Probably out of a food cart? A cup of coffee as coffee. well. Okay. Yeah, and then a sample of a product. Okay, and is there gonna be any amplified sound? No sound. No amplified sound, perfect. And Malin and Goat uh, Gets, excuse me, they, I believe they have a store in Soho, right? Um, I'm not sure. Okay, well, I'm just, I'm just curious. I think there's a store. Somewhere. Yeah. There's a store somewhere in CB2, I think. Um, I feel like I've seen it around. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a pop. They might be sold in other stores. I don't know if they have their own. Um, 235 Elizabeth Street, it looks like, on Google Maps. Okay. Um, all right, I'm gonna take this down. Um, okay, committee members. Committee members have any questions? This I do. Oh, Vasio, yes. So if I understood correctly, the point of this event is regarding the food trucks, the branding of food trucks. And then you're going to be using also the opportunity to give out coffee and the products of the um, skincare products. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So it's, you know, a skincare brand that is wrapping a food cart in this case. So it's not a full truck. It's much smaller um, because of the streets and the sidewalks. We wanted to make sure we, you know, that we don't take up too much space. Um, so that's why we recommend it for a smaller footprint. So it's, it's much smaller than a truck. Um, and they will be giving away free coffee, like, Correct, and also free samples of skincare product to kind of educate people about the brand. 
um, and about the products um, that they have. So, David, please explain. Um, are you pushing the food trucks or are you pushing the product? Could it have been any other product or just the one you just decided to make it this one? Who are no, you involved yeah, with? The brand, yeah, the, so the, the brand reaches out to us, okay, because we work with different food trucks and food carts, and they ask us if we can wrap and promote their product. So it's, you know, people reach out to us. You know, we're not a nonprofit um, association. Um, so people come to us and, and we put on these events for them and we help them. We, we pay, you know, the vendors make money. Um, you know, the city makes money because we, we get these permits for them. So these are events that we do all the time where we really try to make sure that, that everybody's winning. Okay, now I understand it a little better. Thank you so yes. much for answering my question. I apologize if, if I a, thank you, thank you. Thanks, Rocio. Um, Michael? Yes, you mentioned a small footprint. How small is the footprint and where will the queuing occur on the sidewalk or in the street? So the queuing will be in the sidewalk. We, we obviously want to make sure that uh, people in the street are, you know, are not at risk. So the car will be in the street, but it's smaller than, a, you know, a car. It's about, you know, four and a half feet wide by six feet long. The dimension of that. Of the so cart. that's about that's about one the equivalent of one parking space. Yeah, about one parking space. Okay. Um, so that'll be how much it is there, and in front of it will be the line. And like I said, we have staff there to make sure it's like a single file line. People are smoothly walking in, getting a free sample, walking out, and not impeding the traffic. So traffic and pedestrians will will be able to walk, you know, pretty much normally and have the option to participate or not in this, you know, small experience there. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Um, do you know if there was any consideration of doing it in front of the store on Elizabeth Street? Do you know why this specific location was chosen? Um, Just curious. You know, to be honest, I wasn't, you know, someone else from my team was the one that chose okay. it. Um, usually it does come, you know, I know with Soho, there's a lot of bike lanes and things like that and other uh, restrictions that might have made it harder for us to feel that we had a comfortable you know, again, the sidewalk was big enough, the area, so that we don't get into the flow of traffic sometimes, that we, you know, we want to make sure of that when we choose the location. <clears throat> um, okay. That's all answers on that. All right. Um, let's open it up. Any other questions, please raise your hand outside of CB2. Okay. I don't see any more. Um, Thank you, David, for joining. Much appreciated. Thank you for taking the time and appreciate it. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Okay, next event, uh, April 23rd, Amazon Free V Food Truck. This is three different locations. Varick between Grand and Watts, Hudson between King and West Houston, Varick between West Houston and Downing. Curb lane closures. I see Joshua, I'm promoting you. Joshua? There. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes. Hi. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. Thank you guys uh, and ladies for your time. I'm very excited to present. Um, would you prefer I share my screen or do you want to use what I've sent to your email? Um, I, I'm i pulling it up now. If that's, that's probably easier. I'll just share it here. That sounds great. Um, while you're getting that pulled up, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Joshua Berliner. I work with RMNG out on the West Coast based in Hollywood, California. Um, we are coming to New York uh, for multiple events, um, but this one specifically is with the brand Freevee. Uh, Freevee is a streaming service, uh, kind of like Hulu, uh, Netflix, HBO. Something interesting about Freevee is that it is a free service. Um, so it's very appealing to many different people. Um, and I just wanted to show you this presentation, give you some context about um, who we're working with, what we're doing and where we'd like to go, um, and then field any questions or concerns that, that you and the community might have. Um, so without further ado, can you go to the next slide, please? So step one is just what is RMNG? Um, RMNG is a mobile marketing agency that specializes in doing uh, food truck based marketing events. Uh, here, we did a cool one uh, with Portillo's in Times Square. 
Uh, Pertillo's is a very nice, well-known hot dog brand. Um, and I just wanted to show you guys that we're familiar with working um, with SAPO and the, and the city of New York. And we've done some pretty cool things and are excited to come back um, this time around and, and continue, continue the trend of doing cool stuff in New York. Um, so what are we doing this time? You're probably curious about. So the goal for Freebie, and if you could switch over to slide four for me, um, the goal is twofold. Half of it is uh, delighting and surprising the public with empanadas and horchata cold brew. We'll have about 800 daily um, over the course of two days. That'll be 1,600 total servings, um, as well as giving away 100% recycled material tote bags. So this is old billboards that have been taken down, and instead of being thrown out, they have been made into like uh, pretty fancy tote bags um, that are that are branded and Part of a part of an old billboard so something cool that the that the community can walk away with the second part of this is informing media agencies um, of freebies availability um, freebie as a streaming service is not only wanting to tell the average joe hey you can come watch stuff for free on our platform but also want to let the media agencies know hey if you have a show that you think would be a good fit for our library this is this is how you can work with us and just getting on their radar um, trying to, Freebie is trying to expand their content library. And so this is targeted both at the public as well as uh, media agencies specifically. And the way that we're achieving the brand's goals, uh, which we'll see on slide five, is a branded food truck with an A-frame um, and some branded wares. Thank you, sir. Um, so you'll see in the top left, this is a, co a copy of the A-frame signage that will be out front of the truck. It's just a menu letting people know what is available to them for free. Um, you can see some nice tasty photos of empanadas below that, as well as the packaging that we're planning to serve this in. So the bottom right is a, a pastry bag while the top is this the branded sleeve in a nice cup. And then you'll see the truck, which is a mock-up of the wrap itself. So just getting a feel for the branding um, that's gonna be exhibited as part of this event. And moving forward, now that you know a little bit about what we're doing and how we look while we're doing it. I wanted to show you the team that we're working with to get it done. So if you could go to slide uh, seven, uh, it's really important to us to work locally, whether we're in Minnesota or New York. Uh, we always want to work with people that are familiar with the market and are great at what they do. And that's why we've chosen to work exclusively local here. Um, so we have our event manager, who's our eyes and ears and feet on the ground, who is Elisa Williams. Uh, Big D's Grub, who is an active and local uh, food truck vendor in New York City with an annual mobile vending license. Um, we have two brand ambassadors, both local to New York, Sean and Andrea, as well as an off-duty police officer, Officer Kelly, who we like to work with on all of our activations. Um, and this is a really, really strong team, not only to, to get a really beautiful uh, successful program off the ground, but to have it run smoothly and calmly the entire time. Um, these are all people that have worked with us before and have worked with each other before. So moving forward to, you now know what we look like and who we are, but what and or where are we going? Um, so moving forward to the next couple slides, I wanted to go stop, stop by stop and describe to you a little bit about the each location. Um, first things first, you'll see the uh, address and the star. This is the address that we're looking to activate at. You'll see the green box is the uh, is the amount of spaces needed for the vehicle, and the white arrow is the direction of load in, i.e., the direction of traffic. So, just communicating to you guys that I under we understand that traffic doesn't flow both ways always, and that we need to make sure that load in is nice and easy. Um, so, location one on day two, uh, we will arrive here at eight a.m have an hour to prep for service, which will be prepping the empanadas and the horchata cold brew. We'll be operating for two hours, and then we have a very quick uh, kitchen cleanup and securing everything for transit, and then we depart to location two. Um, before moving to location two, uh, if we go to the next slide, I want to show you guys a little bit about our plan for foot traffic. So this is the same location we were just looking at. And here you'll see that we're trying to keep the line away from the storefronts um, and closer to the parking lane on the street um, to A, not impede any business or traffic that would be attending any of these storefronts, um, but also using 
rope and stanchion to make sure that the, the, the line is very clear. Um, you'll also notice that the security guard um, is this red diamond. He's positioned about halfway through the, the line and he can help people keep this area clear so we're not impeding foot traffic moving uh, west on Varick Street. And then you'll see that the brand ambassador, they're actually not stationed directly outside of the truck, but rather uh, along the line to try to keep people, um, to keep answering questions and keep people calm and excited while they're waiting in line so we don't get any anything rowdy happening. Um, I do not expect a line of this size to form. That being said, I do want did want to just call out that we have a contingency plan in order to address it if the line is longer than expected. Um, so moving forward, I want to describe the other two locations in the same fashion, if we could proceed forward. So the second stop um, is right over here at Hudson Street between King Street and West Street. One thing I want to call out here is that this is a one-way street. And if we were to park the vehicle right here, normally the uh, serving window on food trucks is on the passenger side. However, we have serving windows on both sides of the vehicle. So I want to call out that we can park with the flow of traffic here and use the driver's side of the vehicle uh, to make sure that we're not impeding any foot traffic or vehicle traffic. Um, the load in here is also quite quick and we're activating for two hours. So we arrive at around 11.30 a.m. We have 30 minutes of prep time, two hours of live time between noon and 2 p.m. and another 15 minute loadout. Um, Again, I'd like to move forward to the next slide to talk a little bit about our line management. So here you'll see, looks very similar to the last one, um, but we wanna have a line form towards Greenwich Street rather than um, Hudson Street. And we have the same strategy here with the, uh, the off-duty police officer being about halfway through the line and then the BAs being spread along the line as they approach the truck, really just trying to get ahead of any long lines forming and making sure that people are comfortable throughout the duration of their experience. Um, and then without further ado, for the last stop of the day, uh, if we can proceed to the next slide. So we would like to do this location as our third spot. Um, this is metered parking spaces, similar to the rest of the ones that we have been pitching. Uh, the flow of traffic is moving uh, with the direction of the arrow, and this will be serving from the passenger side of the truck. We would set to arrive here at 2.30 p.m., live by 3 p.m. Uh, for another two hours, ending at 5 p.m., and then we have a 30-minute loadout to secure the truck for transit, and then the event is over. Um, there is one last item, which is the line management for this property, so if we can go to the next slide. Um, you'll see here that we are looking to have the line, if needed, go on to West Houston Street. Um, again, you'll see that the BAs are spread along the line and uh, as well as the security guard being around the corner. One thing to note here is we feel that with this layout, if the line does get long, it makes sense to have the line against this green wall rather than closer to the street, um, as that will, pro that will likely cause the least amount of traffic, pedestrian traffic interruptions. Um, so we would put them closer to the wall here, unlike the first location where they'd be closer to the parking lane. Um, all of this considered, we're really excited to come to New York. Um, we're, I'm hoping that you have questions that I can answer. Um, and, and we're excited to get this off the ground. And I, I just wanna say thank you for your time and your attention. And please let me know if I can provide any more information. Thank you, Joshua. That was very comprehensive. I um, appreciate the comprehensive presentation. Um, I think you covered most of my questions. The, the main one I had was with regard to the second location um, and the bike lane. Yes. Can you, uh, can you discuss that, how you would manage that? Yeah, let me pull up real quick. And we're talking about uh, Hudson Street between King Street and West Houston Street. Yeah, West Houston. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my understanding, um, and I, I'll look at Google Maps, my understanding is that that is a parking permit zone for city officials or diplomats. Um, I didn't see, and I'm not saying that it's not there, I didn't see a bike lane when I was viewing it from Google Earth and Google Maps, nor did I have 
SAPO uh, call out that the bike lane would be an issue there? Um, well, it's noted on the application, Hudson between King and West Houston, truck to park in parking lane. Brand yep. ambassador will serve pedestrians via trade to avoid interfering with bike lane. And I think what the interesting thing here is, and I've tried to get this application updated, but the update hasn't been made. So if we look at the um, the like most recent requests for the application, as well as in this presentation, we've actually pivoted to parking on West Houston Street rather than Hudson Street because the bike lane would have caused issues. And so that pivot was made uh, via with SAPO and at, at their discretion saying that West Houston would be a better fit for this activation. And so our preferred location now is actually not on Hudson Street, but it is on West, West Houston. Houston. Okay. Um, let me pull that back up. Yep. And my, so, my apologies. I see it now. Okay. So the application, um, okay. You've changed it. Let me just note that. Yep. I've requested it. I don't think that it's been updated yet, but the request is in and uh, perfect. I, just, I know SAPO's got their hands full, so I didn't want to press them too hard. No. I, okay. That's why I was confused. Cause this one still said Hudson. Okay. But you're parking on Houston. Okay. Apologies so for any confusion there. Okay. So it's Houston between Greenwich and Hudson. Okay. And Hudson. Okay. Thank you. That that clears it up. Yeah, I was I was concerned about going across a bike lane because that causes a big safety issue. So good to see you're not doing totally. That. Yeah, and we got to respect the cyclists. I'm, I'm, I'm I myself am one, and I don't like cool. an empathy in the face. <laughs> okay, uh, let me turn this back off here so I can see people. Okay, uh, Rocio. Thank you very much for your presentation, Joshua. I have. Just a couple of questions, please. Um, this is an Amazon uh, Free V. That's the name of the 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 company that you're going to be pushing forward, right? You want people yes, to know about this this Free V company, which is great. Correct. Um, I have a lot of reservations about food trucks because I think food trucks take a lot of businesses from the brick and mortar places and they don't pay the same kinds of rents that uh, the rest of the food of um, establishments that have brick and mortar. So I'm always mm -hmm. very hesitant about anything like this. But my question is, what is the impact this event is gonna have on the neighborhood and the other service, food service similar to this business and the other businesses in the area where the events will take place? What yeah, impact? I think that's a great question and I really appreciate you asking. Um, so I wanna point out, first of all, um, that while these are highly trafficked locations um, right outside of office complexes, they are not necessarily the same locations that you're gonna find most food trucks choosing to look, like activate at because our target is to, uh, is to target specific office complexes. And so you're not doing necessarily what another food truck might do, which is go to Times Square and capture some like really huge foot traffic. I do also want to point out though, uh, that because we're working with, or working to activate outside of office complexes that while there is food and lunch places around and oftentimes within the, um, within the building itself, I, I want to point out that a I think that our serving sizes are not a full meal. So if anything, I think someone will get hungry by coming and visiting us, and then we'll go and finish <laughs> off their stomachs with another uh, another choice of food. Um, and then the second thing is that where we're parking the trucks, we didn't see within two to three hundred feet necessarily any other businesses that were um, that we would directly impede or are selling the same service. And lastly, the food that we are providing is being provided by local vendors on the horchata cold brew side, as well as the empanada side. So while, while it is taking business away um, from a store in the areas that we're activating from, it is bringing business back into the city of New York in another way. Um, so I just wanted to call that out. Did that answer your question? Thank you very much, Joshua. I, I do appreciate your answer very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions from the board? I don't. You're on mute, Mill. I, I can't quite hear you. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was talking on mute. Um, any other questions from the board? 
I don't see any from the board. Any uh, Darlene has her hand raised. Do you have a question, Darlene? Uh, thank you, Will. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. Uh, Darlene Lutz again. Uh, I have a question about the 75 Varick uh, location, the first one up. Um, are you aware that uh, there is a bus stop uh, that is in the lead into area? I mean, there are, very, there are a couple of parking spaces and then the crosswalk. There's a bus stop from the corner of Watts mm -hmm. to uh, two parking spaces clear of the uh, crosswalk at Grand Street. Mm -hmm. uh, you I am aware, aware of that the the, aware. Place, the placement that I had selected, from my understanding and, and in conversation with Sapo, was avoiding that bus lane. I'm definitely open and flexible to moving the truck around to make sure that we're as far away from that bus route as possible. Um, that is going to be at at. Sapo and, and your discretion. And I just want to let you know that I'm happy to make changes to, to make sure that we're not putting the bus routes in danger. Well, it's a bus stop, not a bus route. And it's a tight squeeze in there to begin with. Um, lots of issues because it comes right after the Holland Tunnel. Uh, totally. And, uh, you know, it's cut off from use uh, for several hours a day because of that fact. Um, the other thing is, is that there's a there's a full service restaurant there um, right in front of where you're going to be parked. And there's also a brand new 24 seven deli in the building across the street uh, that just opened um, and is struggling for business. Uh, so uh, we are concerned because uh, that's in my building and we are concerned that this uh, business succeeds. Anything that takes away from it uh, is of concern to to us we we need it in uh our area and it provides safety and security 24 7 oh. at the corner i think those are very valid points darlene and i would just like to point out that i think while i i would just want to say i'm happy to provide compensation if you're worried about the vendors in your building not getting the business that they need and i know that we're only going to be there for about two hours from 9 a.m to 11 a.m so not only am i happy to compensate them for their uh, willingness to share the road with us and then also count on money instead of risking the, you know, who knows if it's going to be a good day. So not only would I be down for that, but um, I would also be down to speak with them um, and get an understanding for when their highest trafficked hours are, because I do feel with only a two hour activation time that the impact will be minimal, especially if coupled with us paying them for any business that is taken away on behalf of the truck being there. That's very thoughtful, thank you. Valerie De La Rosa? Valerie? Uh, I can't hear you, Valerie. Do you have a question? I don't know if there was a speaker issue there. I have a, a quick question. Sure. Um, and I don't mean any offense by this. This is just one of my first meetings with this community board. As far as remaining here as a participant for the remainder of the meeting, are, is the expectation that all present presenters are here until the end and then we get a basically like notes on approval or denial or is that something that happens via email? Sure. No, you don't have to stay here for the whole time. We, we will have. Whoa. Um, no, we, we will have a business session at the end where we'll decide what resolutions we want to uh, put forth. And then those have to be voted on at full board. In progress. Those have to those be voted, have to be voted, on, voted at the, on at the full board, full board meeting, meeting. In the month. Okay. Board I heard you. Meeting. Thank you very much for that. Clarity. <laughs> Okay, Valerie, is it working now? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Really quickly, um, uh, just two really quick points. Um, one, I used to work down in this area and um, 
It's a lot of ad agencies, a lot of media agencies down here. And it was always a fun surprise to have something like this pop up. It makes you feel good about working in the area and just have, you know, it, I think it's just good for, you know, the Hudson Square as an off a place of office. And uh, I think it's just good um, from a commercial office perspective and um, people, people that are back in the office having this treat or whatnot. Um, and then as far as um, the targeting, this is about the uh, the week of or the week leading up to uh, New Fronts. So mm -hmm. they are targeting uh, media investment buyers who buy ad space on freebie. Uh, that is Amazon. exactly right. Yeah. yeah you got a great so, understanding. Yeah. So I, I appreciate Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Um, I used to work at Condé Nast. So um, anyway, so it, it's, it, you know, it's very targeted, just like he said. And, um, you know, I'm only learning about the application here just being on the meeting, but just to give the committee context as to what this is, it's very targeted. Um, and I think pending, you know, the suggestions um, from Darlene and other residents had about um, just the possible impacts right there. Otherwise, like this is a, this is a, a pretty, um, pretty self-explanatory uh, application and uh, with a really targeted purpose. So anyways, just wanted to add that context. Thanks. Thank you very much for, for sharing that. Um, and I also just want to point out again that while it is targeted, uh, it is completely accessible to the public and there's nothing being sold. So while there is a goal to inform and educate the media agencies, there is not going to be a negative or even neutral experience for just a regular pedestrian that's unaffiliated. They're still going to get an empanada and a nice horchata and a walk away with a smile. Thanks, Joshua. And thanks, Valerie, for the input. Okay. I don't see any more hands raised, so I will uh, let you go. Thank you so much for your time, Joshua. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you. Okay. Next, our next event is the Valentino uh, Beauty Double Decker Bus, April 28th through April 30th, LaGuardia between Bleecker and West Houston, curb lane closure. Hi, uh, Dolly, I've promoted you. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm doing good, how are you guys? Doing well. Thanks for um, uh, thanks for sticking on our meeting. Of course, of course. I sent through a quick deck um, okay. to your email. So as you pull that up, I'll just get started. Um, my name is Dali Nunez. I'm one of the project managers at Vector Media. Um, we do a ton of experiential experiences on double decker buses. Um, and we're working with Valentino Beauty again, which I'm sure um, I feel like I met <laughs> with this community board back in December when they did their uh, Valentino Beauty holiday launch in mm -hmm. meatpacking. And this time around, they're looking to permit a curb lane on LaGuardia Place between Bleecker Street and, what, and West Houston um, from April 28th to April 30th to promote the launch of their spring Born in Roma makeup and fragrance collection. Um, on one of our double decker buses, we hosted again this activation in meatpacking in December, and it was really a success. Um, Sephora, Sephora ended up selling out of the product at their meatpacking location, so that was super exciting. Um, this time around, the interior of the bus is going to feature Valentino's classic, classic studs, um, some vanity stations showcasing the products. Um, some photo moments and some magic mirrors, which are really just iPads, um, which will allow consumers to explore and test the products sets uh, digitally so they can try on different colors via the iPad through augmented reality. Um, we're going to have some product specialists on board to help consum consumers with any questions about the products. Um, and then brand ambassadors are just going to welcome guests to the upper level for free samples and another photo moment. Um, we're gonna be giving away some bounce back cards. Those are kind of limited, um, but those are basically just these cards that you get um, where you would be able to redeem complimentary deluxe fragrance and makeup samples um, with a purchase at local retailers. So in Soho, their local retailers are Sephora on Broadway and the Bloomingdale's on Broadway. 
Um, and that's really the activation. Everything's gonna be contained to the interior of the bus. Um, each day the bus would load into the curb lane at 9 a.m. for setup. And by setup, we just mean cleaning the interior of the bus and setting up all the product on the inside and um, sorting through all of the samples that we'll be giving out for the day. Um, the activation would run from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. each day. And then the loadout is pretty simple. Um, it would probably take us 30 minutes. So we'd be out of the curb lane by 7.30. Um, we're gonna have uh, an off-duty NYPD with us just for the safety of our brand ambassadors to make sure that he helps with line management. Um, we'll also have a brand ambassador outside helping with line management. Um, we usually rotate them just so that they're not st standing in the same spot the entire day. So um, it'll be a team effort. Um, I do think that is it pretty straightforward. Oh, we will have, okay. So for our holiday activation, we had a DJ on the upper level, um, for the meatpacking. So we got our sound permits through the police precinct. Um, this time around, they're also looking to have a DJ. Um, but the, the noise levels are not, you can't really hear it outside of the bus. Um, it's not one that's like booming. We have a speaker downstairs for the interior and then a speaker on the upper level so that the people on the bus can hear it. You cannot hear the music from the outside of the bus. So I did want to call that out um, because in the permit I did put that we will have amplified sound, but I'm not sure that what we're doing constitutes as um, amplified sound since you can't hear it from the sidewalk. Um, so yeah, that's the activation. Uh, William is scrolling through some of the interior build photos of what it'll look like on the inside. Um, and yeah, happy to answer any questions. Thanks, thanks, Dolly. Appreciate. Um, just to make sure I have the dates right. So, you're it's is it three days? It's the 28th, 29th, and 30th. Correct. Okay. And are, are you leaving it there overnight, the night of the 28th and 29th? Yeah. So okay. we'll bring we'll load out at 7:30 or by 7:30 each day, and it'll go back to its bus yard, and then come back each morning. Oh, okay, you're you're taking it out each day at 7:30. You're not leaving. It. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, I definitely remember the Sephora one. It, it's, it's very similar. Yeah. Um, it, um, it, that was only like, a few months ago. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it's, they're repurposing a lot of the stuff from the first build. They're just changing out the colors to match their spring campaign. Got it. Mm. Okay. This, anyone have questions? This might still be fresh in the committee's mind with the last double decker, so. I don't remember if the last one they had to bring the opposite way down the street because of the way the, the door opened. Is that an issue here or no? I have to look at Google Maps. It's not an issue for this one. Okay. The um, door opens on the passenger side. Perfect. So it'll lead right onto the sidewalk. Perfect. And we won't have any additional elements on the exterior. Um, we'll just have our staff helping cue people. Okay. Rocio? Uh, yes, thank you so much, uh, Dali, for uh, presenting. Um, just a couple of questions regarding the sound, the DJ. Sure. Uh, you mentioned that it will not be heard. Will the doors to the bus be kept open? Yeah, so it's interesting because I was testing it out at the meat packing, knowing that um, sound is an issue in these residential areas. So we are like very aware of that. So the door is open on the lower level, but we keep it, we keep the sound to a minimum. You can't hear it. There's just too much New York City noise going on. The upper level is an open deck. Um, and we'll have a speaker up there, but we'll have it at a volume where you can't hear it from the sidewalk. It's really just so that people on the upper level can hear. Um, and I know that in the past, we um, have permitted um, 
I believe it was on Broadway and our music was a little high and somebody came down and told us to put it down from the bid and we had no issue with that. So we've learned our, our lesson and we know that we need to keep it to less than a certain number of decibels. Did you have any other complaints from anybody else besides that time that when somebody asked you to lower? No, it was actually someone from the bid who came to introduce themselves at the top of the activation. And they were just like, this might be a little too loud. You might want to put it down. And we did. Great. Thank you so much. No problem. Thanks, Rocio. Michael? Yeah, if the upper deck is open and the weather is inclement, that means all activities would occur on the lower deck. Would that cause crowd congestion and a lot of queuing on the sidewalk? Have you thought that out? Yes. It's so typically, um, we actually did encounter that uh, during the holiday season. Um, we, we were rained out for two of the days, so we just closed the upper deck out. Um, and we didn't, and we just brought the samples downstairs. We didn't experience any congestion on the lower level or um, a long queue. Um, but the idea would be to limit the amount of activity going on on the bus. So it would probably be a like less dwell time inside the bus. So we would be able to like circle through the amount of people going onto the bus to prevent uh, the queue getting long. Thank you. Okay, uh, do we have any other questions? Seeing none, uh, thank you, Dali. We'll move on to the next event. Thanks for your time tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Will, I just wanted to point out there was a comment from one of our applicants in the chat regarding timing. I don't know if this, if this uh, applicant's still around, but um, if we, if they're if they can, if we can hear them because I don't know about rescheduling, that's a viable option. Um, sure. Yeah, we can't really reschedule because the next meeting won't be till May 9th. So, um, sure, we can jump. Why, Daria, why don't we go to your event now? Uh, if you want to raise your hand, I can promote you. I don't know if she's already, she's already, I mean, she's she still, she, she's still a participant, yeah. but I, I, I put promote and I don't know if they're still here. So, um, okay. Uh, yeah. We, I mean, we usually just go in order. Um, okay. We'll see if, uh, if they come back on, um, but let's go ahead and go to the next one. Um, so the next one we have is the Coach Tabby Tour, Gansvor Plaza. I see two people. Okay. So Kelsey and Kelly, I've promoted you both to panelists. Thank you. Hi, Kelsey. Um, hi, how are you? Good. Good. I had I did send you a PowerPoint as well, um, a yep. PDF, if you wouldn't mind pulling that up. Sure. And then while you get that pulled up, just a quick introduction. My name is Kelsey Leach. I work at Activate. Um, Kelly Bloodworth is also with me. We're uh, producers. Kelly is our production manager, and we work for an experiential marketing agency. So very well versed in um, experiential and looking forward to coming back to New York. We were um, in New York in August for a different experience, but looking forward to bring our Coach Tabby tour to the city. So Great. just as um, a quick background, uh, so what we're doing is we are bringing an ice cream experience currently on tour throughout the Southeast and um, our end point is New York City. So we actually had our third activation today. So once we get to New York City, we'll be quite well-oiled machine. Um, but if you wanna go to the next photo, just kind of on page two, gives you a little bit more of what we're looking um, to do with our experience. So this is our ice cream experience that we have. 
Um, this is a trailer that we have that fits everything in there and on top, uh, it's to promote our coach tabby purse. So we're working with the coach brand um, to promote the new tabby 26 purse. And that is a foam purse built on top of um, our trailer that we construct on site. And then uh, through the uh, ice cream experience, we have multiple staff members and brand ambassadors working on the interior with um, a fully designed uh, um, health permitted trailer that we have ice cream freezers and then also three compartment hand, uh, three compartment sink and then hand washing sink in there as well. All of the staff that are serving ice cream are all serve safe certified. So really um, important to us that the health and safety is um, of key importance on this this tour. Um, so basically the experience starts kind of over to the left. We do have an entrance point um, where guests line up and they'll queue. So, and then if you wanna go to slide three, I'll just kind of explain what we're where we are. So looking to be in Gansevoort Plaza here, you'll see uh, the trailers right there um, in the pink. And then we would queue the line out into the left and then around on uh, 9th Street. So kind of towards where that 16 foot refrigerated truck is located, the blue box. Um, so we would queue out to the left and then around the corner um, on that one side there's, so there's the little bushes on that. And so we would queue kind of in between there um, in a single file line. So we do have that entry point and then the exit point would be on the opposite side of the trailer where they can either um, continue on into the plaza or exit through um, and continue on to Gansport Street. So that's kind of our flow. We do, we will have a security um, personnel on site at all times to help with line management throughout the day. And then also um, at night as well. Um, so our timeframe will be there on May 5th. So we'll load in early, we load in around 5 a.m. So there's not an impede of any traffic. Um, and then we'll get, it takes us about two and a half hours to three hours to set up. So we'll be all set up. Um, I do wanna mention that the purse is of course contingent on weather. So anytime that um, there is gusty winds or it is raining, the, if it's just raining, the purse can be constructed on the ground. But if there's any chance of wind or thunderstorms, um, the purse will not be set up. So again, taking in mind um, all of that safety and what that looks like. Um, and then as far as opening hours, so we will be open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. And we do have a cap of 2,500 servings and that's about 300 per hour. So it's as soon as the ice cream is gone for the day, we close up. Um, we have been monitoring this flow. We've had, like I said, we've had three activations so far on um, campuses. So a little bit different, but similar kind of setup and kind of rotating staff, um, making sure that we have about two to three additional staff in um, addition to that security member that we will be hiring um, just to monitor and line manage as well. And then of course, enough staff inside of the ice cream um, experience to kind of rotate and make sure we can get through enough people, but also wanting them to really fully e experience what we're looking to do. Um, and then an, one additional element that we have is a product display with the purses. So if you wanna scroll to slide four for me, these are just some more um, activation photos that are recent um, within the past week that we've had on campus. So you'll see the top is uh, our ice cream experience and then the coach letters that we'll also have that actually will be um, more in front of that, our trailer and um, some more of just a photo engagement experience. And then on the bottom is that product display wall that are actually, all of those purses are secured to um, the product display. And then we'll also have additional staff um, that's from the coach store that will be on site that can give product details and make sure those um, are secured. So we have about two to three people surrounding that area in addition to our brand ambassadors and security um, just to monitor and manage all the lines. And then as far as other line management, we have um, stanchions that we can set up as well and plan to set up just no, so va a ser largo. we can monitor um, the start and end points. Um, and then uh, from there, I think the only other thing is not really any amplified sound. We do have two speakers that go, they're just small JBL speakers that go inside of um, the ice cream uh, trailer here. 
and they just space out. But again, it is kind of one of those things that you can't really hear it until you actually get up there. So it's more of a when you enter the actual space that you can hear, um, but not much surrounding that. Great. Um, as far, sorry, were you done? Or? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, as far as generators, did you speak to the folks at uh, the plaza about the electric hookup there? Are you going to be able to use that? So we will, um, to keep the freezers cold overnight, we will be able to plug into their power. We do have two generators um, that will be located on our hitch, and we've actually been removing them and have a, a custom generator cover um, on those. And so we will be working with permitting to get that. It's just with the power that is needed on the interior, um, just with lighting. And then we have a, a neon sign in the back, just a few extra things It does exceed their power capabilities. So we will be using our generators on site. Um, and then we'll shut those off at night when we're no longer on site and then plug into their power just for the freezers. Great. And then as far as uh, it looks going back to um, this, I mean, relative to the rest of the plaza, you intend on just leaving the rest of the plaza as is in terms of the chairs and tables that are existing out there already because I think that's a big point that we care about is just making sure people can still generally use the plaza um, as they would normally use it. Yeah, absolutely. So we've talked about specifically just our footprint, removing those red umbrellas and um, the chairs and tables that are there. But since this is somewhat of a food experience, we want to make sure that there is still seating around for those who would like to stay and, and um, kind of still be around the experience, but also open to public and you know them kind of being around seeing what's going on as well. So just within our footprint, we would be removing it. Um, and then you know to the to the right, we would still continue to maintain that footprint with the tables and the umbrellas. Okay, cool. Let me take this down. So I see Rocio has her hand raised. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, besides the ice cream that you are going to be distributing, are there any other products being distributed or sold? And that's the first question. The second question is, Kelsey, could you please tell us how this particular event is going to really benefit the community? Of course. So first question, there is no nothing else that's being distributed. Um, in the original application, we were potentially going to have bracelets distributed, but that's no longer part of our event. It's just ice cream. Um, so I wanted to make that clear too. It's just the giveaway and it's unbranded and it's very specific to our experience. So, um, and for sample size as well on the ice cream, it is a three ounce sample. So it, it's a pretty small sample of ice cream um, to not be competitive with anyone near. And then as far as impact, I think, um, you know, we were really excited to be a part of the community in um, Gansevoort and Meatpacking District, um, working close with the tapestry brands and coach. Um, you know, I think that they they really wanted to do something in this district and kind of get um, specifically to this demographic um, and, you know, just have a fun and engaging experience with the overall community. So we're really looking forward to being a part of this. And Kelly, feel free to add as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, maybe, maybe Kelsey, for those that don't know, you can just elaborate on the other brands owned by the Tapestry Parent that may have a presence in meatpacking. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Tapestry Brands that are specific is um, so Coach, obviously, who we're directly working with, and then Kate Spade and Stuart Weitzman are also under that Tapestry brand. Thank you. Michael? Yes, can you tell us quickly um, how much of the plaza will be open for public use if you're moving benches and umbrellas and you're setting up your activation, how much of the plaza is still free for public use for those who might not want to participate in the activation? Yeah, absolutely. So we're looking to hit that medium size event. So um, less than 50%. I think at this point, we're looking to remove about 10 tables and umbrellas and then keep the remaining area. So really looking to make it half of that uh, plaza area. So half of the plaza area will still be open to the public. Correct. Thank you. Welcome. Did you mention, do you know where the, just out of curiosity, where the ice cream is being sourced from? Yeah, absolutely. 
Yep. So we were, we've been working with a vendor um, directly out of Atlanta and um, they're really great. We have health certifications with them. And so what we'll be doing is um, shipping the ice cream to an overnight freezer. Um, and then we have commissaries also that we've sourced along the way, but they're, the vendor is butter and cream. And so um, they're kind of comparable to a Jenny's or Van Leeuwen's, but like I said, on site will actually be unbranded. So there's no promotion or taking away from any of those brands on site. I'm gonna promote Donna as a question. I have one more question. Sure, um, and then and then you go and then Donna can go, go ahead. Yeah, Kelsey, what are you doing about receptacles for the garbage that is going to be produced from the ice cream uh, cups? Absolutely, so we have currently three trash receptacles on site. And then we're working um, closely with uh, Gansport Plaza. There is a loading dock there that we can dispose of um, throughout the day. We do have an on-site operations team that's there from setup until teardown that uh, does rotations constantly to ensure that those are properly uh, disposed of. And right. um, up to this point, we've had about a thousand people per stop and we've only had about six bags of trash and we are collecting all cups. Thank you so much. Welcome. Okay. Donna? Yeah. Could you go over again which direction the line is going, how you're going to form that line? Absolutely. So I don't know if it would be easier to pull up again, will you? Or it's going to go. Yeah. So um, you can see the little pink trailer here. So um, essentially, the line would queue out to the left. And then it would curve around onto 9th Street, so kind of towards uh, where that bush is located, and go down that lane right there um, in a single file lane so we can push it to one side so it wouldn't impede the left side of that sidewalk area. So right by, so to the, to the western side of the planter box. Yes, uh, let's see. On the right side of that planter box. On the yeah, right, so, so that's yeah. right, that's sort of where the the entry to Lucid is in front of their in front of their doorways. So we would I think there's an additional sidewalk to the right of that. So we mm -hmm. would kind of be in between those two. So we would still want to make sure that the line for Lucid, there was space for that on the right. So we mm -hmm. would kind of be in the middle and then on the left side of where that um, those planter boxes are, that would still be open for public to go uh, walkway, a walkway on that side as well. Okay, I would just be conscious that a lot of people do come come down that sidewalk that way to go carry through. So you're gonna have to have a break in there for people to be able to do that. And I was actually going to say that this doesn't look like it takes up that larger footprint on here, but you just said it takes up about 50%. So is this diagram not really accurate to how much clear, you know, how much space is not being taken up? This is accurate to what our specific footprint would take up. I think my reference was just to which to the umbrellas and the chairs that we would be removing. So okay. it would be that space in front of our activation of where the actual, um, just for the sight line, so we could remove those, but then to the right and to the left, everything would stay in place. So that's kind of where I got my percentage, but this is pretty accurate to scale. Okay. And then are you going to be putting rope lines around or are you just going to be kind of directing people? How is that going to work? Yeah, thank you for asking. So um, we do have stanchions that we'll be bringing on site. So we'll definitely be utilizing those as we can um, to direct. And then we'll have uh, both security and brand ambassadors that will monitor that line. And then of course, taking your note into consideration if there does need to be any breaks, having a staff member there just so we can monitor that as well. So you're figuring the stanchions would just go to form the line over on that side, not in front of it or around it on the other side. We would probably look to put some on that right side as well, just so mm -hmm. we can have a clear exit point um, okay. and in front, just so it's clear of where the entrance and exit would be. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Donna. Do we have any other questions on this one? Seeing none, thank you, Kelsey. Thank you, Kelly. Appreciate you so your much. time and for sticking on our, our long meeting tonight. No worries. Thank, Thank you so much. much for your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. So we, have, we now have uh, next event, Neighborhood Sidewalk Sale.
uh, Bedford Downing Block Association. I see Marianne is on here. Hi, Marianne. Here she is. Marianne. Can you hear me now? Yes, hi. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Thank you for good, joining. Good. Thank you. So go, go ahead, please, and just um, if you could give a brief overview. Oh, uh, I'm going to be really brief compared to what happened prior. <laughs> it's just a neighborhood sidewalk sale, plain and simple. Everybody, you know, gets their old stuff from their house and sells it. That's it. That's it. Okay. Yep. Um, have you have you have you guys done this before with the Block Association? We did. We did it okay. uh, prior to COVID. So I guess that was 2019 was the last time we did it on Sixth Avenue, and we did it years before on Downing Street. We used to close Downing Street. Uh, but that became more complicated. So that's not, that's now why we do it on the sidewalk of 6th Avenue. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. That's probably why it didn't show up as FYI renewal um, if you had paused it for a few years. But good to hear that it's a regular event. Yes. Uh, okay. Do you know about, just out of curiosity, about how many people participate in terms of people bringing stuff out to sell? Well, it's a little slow this year. So it's probably like 20 vendors at this point max it seems right and it's it's so it's all people just living on the block basically in the you know you know there's some outsiders but for the most part it's people just on on the two blocks bedford and downing street the neighborhood you know bdba cool great and as far as hours you had 8 30 a.m to 6 30 p.m well, 8.30 kind of more for setup, but like 10 to 5 for the actual sale. So 5 to 6 for breakdown, 8.30 to 10 for a setup. Okay. Seems pretty straightforward to me. Um, yeah, normally I think an event like this, we would have under the FYI renewal. Um, but I don't know what that means. I'm sorry. Usually, for for the, something that recurs every year that hasn't generated any issues, we just put on FYI renewals. So you wouldn't, assuming that you know the event goes well, etc., which I'm sure it will, then you wouldn't have to come back next year. We would just put it on a renewal list. Well, I guess COVID just changed that. Yeah, well. yeah, I think so. Okay. Um. Okay. I'm gonna open it up. Does anyone else have questions on this one? Carter. Thanks. Having been to many of these, these are exactly the type of events we want to see in our community. I just wanted to say Agreed. that and just point to, out to people that these we used to have many more of these throughout the community. And it's great when neighborhood groups get together so that people can meet their neighbors and do these types of events and um, be nice to see some of them which have stopped to come back. Thanks. And thank you for continuing this, Marianne. Oh, and I appreciate your comments, Carter. Thank you. And I agree 100%. Um, thanks. Thanks, Carter. Thanks, Marianne, for coming. I don't see any other questions. Okay. And I don't have to stay on to see you guys vote or yay or nay. No, or not, you, right? You okay. Do not. You do not. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night. You too. Good night. Okay. Um, next up. SHM fundraiser, Bond Street between Lafayette and Bowery. So we have SHM and then we have Penn up next after that. So I see Joshua for SHM. I've just promoted you. Hi, Joshua. Hello, how are you doing? Doing well, how are you? Good, you have Joshua and Daniel here as well. Hi guys. William. Re representing the Sephardic Heritage Museum. That's what SHM stands for, by the way. 
Um, so for some context, the Sephardic Heritage Museum is the largest known collection of artifacts and archives dark documenting the communities of Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, um, and some other regions throughout the Middle East. Um, so the, the organization's been around for over 10 years, you know, really collecting these artifacts, documenting them, as well as creating films and, and really just commemorizing the incredible Sephardic community. So we're on the board there. And the idea for what we want to present is a single day event um, that really brings awareness to the Sephardic community, its rich artifacts, and then also, you know, we'll be giving away pamphlets and things like that to also encourage fundraising down the line. It won't be a fundraiser, so no one will be fundraising at the event, but um, just to kind of build that awareness for go forward. Um, and then in tandem, we actually are launching our seventh film um, in the next two weeks. So this will be kind of a good way to really line up with that film, which is specifically around the history of Egypt and, and those Sephardic communities that have since migrated to the U.S. and, and have, you know, integrated into this larger New York community. Um, and, and then specifically, as far as the event, William, did you get the, uh, the, the site map that I sent over? Yes. Would you like me to share it? Yeah, that, that would be good. Thanks. Just give a little lens into it. Cool. So, so some things have been updated since, but this was, was kind of the latest that I'd shared to the platform, but basically we're doing a single day event, right? So we'll start loading at 9 a.m. Um, it'll go through around 12 p.m. just setting up. The event will take, take place from 12 until 5 p.m. And then from there, we'll close it out. I know we have to be out around like 8 p.m. is my understanding. So we have more than enough time to do so. And right. then as far as the actual activities that are happening on site, so we're going to have a few food vendors. Um, most of them are going to be celebrating like the Sephardic style foods. Um, so assume like four food vendors around this top block piece here. Um, seating. Um, this bar is going to be non-alcoholic uh, uh, beverages. And then we're going to have music being played, an art installation here. Um, and then just like, I just put ad, which is like probably some advertisement that we'll have around the, the, the business that'll be, you know, like a stage and giving out flyers and things like that. And then a fire escape as noted here, 15 feet. Um, and then the other piece that is worth noting is that we are working closely just with like the, the local partners here. So for example, like Il Buco, um, who has hosted block events here on Bond Street will be partaking in the event. Event, and then 50 Bond Street is actually going to be occupied by a Sephardic run business. So we're going to be also collaborating with them as far as access to their space, leveraging them as an entrance and even having an art installation inside of 50 Bond Street. Um, and then beyond that, uh, we are just taking into consideration like it's going to be a private event, so it'll be blockaded. But regardless, we will have security. So all the red dots that you see on the screen will represent security corridors just to prevent people from kind of lingering in or anything of that sort. Um, and then the green pieces are trees just for, for some context. And then as far as the amount of people that we expect, um, we expect somewhere between like probably 600, 500 to 600 people throughout the day. Um, so it is a fair amount, but at once we probably don't expect to have more than like 150. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's most of the logistics. Okay. So I just, thanks for the presentation. I just want to make sure I understand. So you said this is a private event. Why, why, why not open it up to members of the public who want to learn more about the museum? Great question. So basically what we're doing is we're just, we're, we're making it private because we don't want to get things, get things out of hand. But what we are doing is the weeks leading up to it, we're inviting people and we're promoting it heavily to make sure that we are getting local people in NoHo to come to the event. Um, I do think that just given the nature of how we're, 
for, like proceeding right now is it is private, but at the same time, w- there is going to be like accessible places for people to sign up even at the event if we aren't at capacity. And it's, is it free entry? Free entry. Okay. Okay. So if someone comes and sees the event and wants to come in, if there's room, they, you will let them in? Correct. But we, we're going to have a list for the beginning just to make sure that it doesn't get to capacity. Okay. Do you, just out of curiosity, um, do you have a space in, in this? Are you located in the city? Do you have a physical space that people can come to or are you sort of operating? Um, well, I don't know what the right term is, but like in the cloud. <laughs> yeah, we have basically like warehouses where we like uh, house our artifacts and then we'll, we'll do like various installations. So there is an installation um, in a building in Brooklyn and then another one in New Jersey. But um, no one museum right now that's living in New York, um, okay. though it's something that is in the works. Okay, so you said non-alcoholic bar, food vendors, Il Buco, you said is involved in there. So they're going to be so- part of the food vending, you said? Exactly. And the other food vendors, do you know who, where they're going to be from yet? Are they going to be New York based? New York based, all of them. Um, all right, I'll let someone else talk for a bit. Michael? Quick question. I may have missed this. Are you seeking to close the entire street or a portion thereof? It, it's only a portion of the street that we're going to be occupying. Um, Can you tell us how much of it? It's around 4,000 square feet. Oh, does that include the parking lane, curb lane, movement lane? Uh, can you just describe that again? For sure. William, do you want to pull up the... Uh... Sure. Yeah, I'll pull this back up. Um... So basically the top and bottom pieces just like annotate the addresses. And then the fire escape is that red component there um, to just ensure that there's access through for any emergencies um, and whatnot. And then the gray portion, it basically represents our portion of the event. So what percentage of the road are you using? It's around like 15, 15% of the block of that bond street between Lafayette and Bowery. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. No problem. And you said there was a DJ, right? But you're not having any live performers? Exactly. Okay. And is the sidewalk here staying open? Yes? Yes. So you can go around the outside of the event. Yeah. Right. Okay. Rocio? A couple of questions, please. Thank you so much for presenting. Um, Question is, where are the non-alcoholic beverages being dispensed? Number one. Number two is, what is the role of Il Buco and 50 Bond Street? Uh, I'm not sure what 50 Bond Street is, but I know what Il Buco is, is a restaurant. And I believe that they also have a liquor license. Will they be also involved in selling their alcohol to the people who attend or they or will the people be going into their premises great question so will il buco will basically be operating as is on their portion of the restaurant so anything that they sell is like their normal kind of standard of business um anything that they integrate into our space is going to be only food so no liquor um to, to your question and then selling food um and then as far as the trash components so we are going to have the trash receptacles there right near the space. And then because not only do we have that, but we also have access to 50 Bond Street for any movement of garbage, if anything does overflow, to be able to store it there as well. What is 50 Bond Street? Would you please so tell 50 me? Bond is just, just a space that we were able to kind of just get access to that's on the block. Um, for any is it an just, empty retail space right now? It's an empty retail space, exactly. It's vacant. Vacant, exactly. Okay. Got it. Thank you. No, no problem. 
So just looking at the map, the Il Buco patio is kind of is outside the bounds of the event, right? So that's what you're saying. They'll just operate normally, but then they're also going to be maybe delivering some food to be served in the event as well, basically, Precisely. so that they can partake. Exactly. Okay. Makes sense to me. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? Carter? Yeah, the, the road's about 40 feet wide, and so a 15 foot clearance leaves about 25 feet left. And the placement of, and, and it's also an open street. So when you're having the event, El Buco has the street closed. So I don't understand how the diagram would actually work um, because Il Buco goes up to about 50% of the street. Um, your the, this, the diagram you presented is not nearly to scale at all um, the way it's presented. And I'm not sure how this setup can actually function with uh, with an emergency lane that's passable. So are you saying that the the scale of the the diagram basically portrays that we won't actually be able to open up 15 feet? Is that is that right? Well, what, what I'm saying is it doesn't include that this is an open street where Il Buco puts out tables and chairs to the middle of the center line. The street is closed every weekend uh friday evening saturday and sunday and el buco takes up um if, if looking at your diagram to the middle of the street extending from where it says el buco patio and so the way this is set up i, I i'm i'm not sure i see how emergency vehicles would be able to navigate that diagonal and it would in both el buco and fish cheeks have their emergency lanes on the north side of the street along the curb. Yeah. So so basically got guidance that we got when we were deciding which part of the street for the fire escape to open up was that we can open up on the on the far side of the street because there is still sufficient access for them to drive around Il Buco um, and Fish Cheeks um, after going through it. But if, if that's not the case, we could definitely explore I'm just saying that your diagram and whomever you may have spoken to probably did not include the fact that this is an open street and they put they're allowed to put out additional tables and chairs to them basically to leave a 15 foot lane on the other side and so the way you have this proximity is a a very, I'm not sure that a, a longer emergency vehicle can go down this lane and then go to the other end to the north side of the block unless you leave wh whatever the, you know, the sufficient diagonal is, which would then move your whole event down. I mean, is there any reason you couldn't just flip this? Yeah, there's no reason we can't flip it. And have the fire escape on the north side? Exactly. And, and we're, we're, we're not like very constrained by space, so to speak. So we're, we're, when we're setting it up, we're going to also make sure that there is sufficient space for, for them to access. Um, but in this case, we could easily flip it to the other side. And then I the, think it's an important point that Carter's making. Thank you, Carter. Um, and, and then the other point is, you know, why do you need DJs? I mean, it's a private event. What's the nexus to this space? I mean, I live on this block. I am, you know, we're inundated with noise. It's already closed every single weekend. I'm not sure what any benefit there is to having, you know, 600 people uh, on the street for a closed private event. Definitely. So, so basically as far as the music component, uh, that's just like a social element. Uh, we're just bringing people together and, and really celebrating it. Um, and then as far as the private nature of it, I think, again, it's less so to kind of, make people not be able to access the event. Um, I think it was more so just to manage the flow of people coming in. If people do show up to the event and, and want to pass by and we don't feel like we're at capacity, we're going to let them through. Okay. And, and, and you're, you're, you're aware that the Il Buco's past events are very controversial and the board hasn't supported. I don't think any of them. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? 
Uh, yeah, I think what Obuko has done in the past is is definitely set a foundation for themselves and and how they approach it, um, which I think is a little bit different than what we're doing. Well, they don't have DJs and noise and, you know, they have an event where they, they, they've done a pig roast, which, you know, certainly has a lot of supporters and detractors, but it's not a DJ playing music on the block for a good portion of the day. For sure. Yeah, I think um, if there's specific concerns about the DJ component, we're, we're definitely happy to address that piece. And then just lastly, did you get a sound permit from the ninth precinct? So we're, 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 they're well aware of, of our working. And the idea was that once we kind of move past this stage, that we would be able to kind of move into that phase. And they've told us that we would be able to, um, as long as we followed all of their uh, rules and regulations. Okay, hey, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? No. Okay. Um, thank you for coming to the meeting. Uh, Joshua, appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. Okay. The next, we have uh, the Pin World Voices Festival. This, I think, is two events. So I'm hoping the applicant here can speak to both of them. They might have dropped off. Okay. Oh, Sabir. Okay. Let me promote you. William? Yes. Can you tell me if Little Red's going to be heard tonight? That's an FYI renewal. So no, they're not going to be on. No, we don't we don't make FYI renewals present. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. My daughter was waiting to see if she had a present or not. Oh no, no, for FYI, we <laughs> they FYIs never have to present. No. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh Sabir, is that am I pronouncing it right? How's it actually hi? My name is Jenny yes. Tibbles, and I'm the oh, producer Jenny. of Pen America's World Voices Festival. Sabir Sultan is the associate director of the festival, but had to be uh, at another event tonight. So I'm I'm stepping in. Okay. Uh, thanks for joining, uh, Jenny. Um, so we we have two applications. Are you able to speak to both? I think one is for um, one is for the Astor Place Plaza. These are both on May 13th, and one mm -hmm. is for LaGuardia between West Third and Bleecker. Yes. Okay. So okay. Did is there a diagram or anything you sent? Yeah, I sent an email uh, at the beginning of the meeting. I see it. When, okay. Yeah. Okay. I will share my screen. Great. Thank you. Okay. Can everybody see? Uh, yes. Uh, one second. Okay. Thank you, and hello everyone. My name is Jenny Tibbles, and as I mentioned, I'm the producer of PEN America's World Voices Festival. Um, we've submitted an application for uh, two spaces, and one of those is Astor Place, where we intend to hold an event, as well as uh, an interactive art installation, if possible, on Saturday, May 13th from 12 to 5. And then the other is outside of the NYU um, Center for Architecture, known as AIA. Um, to hold an indie lit fair on the sidewalk just outside of their uh, facility where we would be holding multiple events all four days of the festival. So just to give a step out a little and give a brief over, overview for those who may not know, PEN America is a 100 year old organization just celebrated our centenary that stands at the intersection of literature and human rights to protect free speech um, both in the United States and worldwide. There are centers globally around the world um, advocating for the needs of writers, and in particular, writers who are at risk, um, many of whom have been imprisoned for speaking freely or, or writing. 
The festival was uh, a more recent founding, and that was in 2004 by author Salman Rushdie. Um, and that was uh, founded in the wake of 9-11 to try to counter isolationism of the United States um, in response to the events of 9-11 and to bring people together to find our common ground and to connect. So the festival has been um, held annually since 2004, and this year features 40 events. Um, and we'll be hosting more than 100 writers from over 27 different countries and around this country. All of these events will be held at about 12 different venues in the village. And so we're excited that, um, that we have this opportunity, I hope, this possibility of presenting some of these events outside so that we can, in addition to hosting events that um, uh, anyone can pay $20 to come see, we also want to have some free events that allow people to access um, what is what is offered by the festival and the authors who are in attendance. So to share a little bit about the event that would happen here where um, we have the diagram, this would be an event held by the Worker Writers School. And essentially, um, this event would feature members of New York City's frontline workers, for example, Domestic Workers United, New York Taxi Workers Alliance, the Street Vendor Project, and several others as they read from their new anthology called Coronavirus Haiku. And it's an exploration of life on the COVID front lines that was written during Zoom workshops uh, during the lockdown. So essentially, um, as you can see in the bottom left of the screen, there's a little stage there, which is kind of the square. Um, yeah, exactly. Bottom left, thank you. Um, this is the South Plaza, and this is the Southwest corner of the South Plaza. And so the idea is that there would be a small stage in which one speaker can present their work, um, amplified sound, just one microphone. And the event would probably be held uh, between like an hour and an hour, 30 minutes. And so that would be all of the amplified sound we would be asking for in Astor Place that day. Um, in addition, if you look at the top right corner, which is the northeast corner, there's a rectangle there. And that is um, basically a sort of banned books installation. It's an interactive, uh, sort of like a giant bookshelf. And there's all of these different banned books on it that have different ways that you can interact with them. You can look at certain passages that have been edited. You can read about why the book has been banned, the states it's been banned. There's a number of statistics shared about which states have been banning the most books. And there's also a number of cards and letters and notes from students who have written and shared their responses to how they feel about books being taken off the shelves in their libraries. So essentially, um, we would just need to have the space, the footprint for that particular bookshelf, which if you have uh, what I've had in my apartment for many years, the, the old school Ikea bookshelf that is like sort of the cubes, the squares, um, it's basically something of, of that size that um, would basically live there for the afternoon. Basically, no products are being distributed or sold in this um, Astor Place area. And uh, as I mentioned before, the only sound amplification would be one microphone. Uh, moving into the second area, which I actually, I, forgive me, I didn't realize we were covering both tonight, so I don't have the drawing for that one yet. That's okay. Um, thank you. I, I just wanted to share the idea there is that we have the CLMP Indie Lit Fair. And so that is a place where the small presses are able to share um, some of their more niche publications uh, for sale. And that will be, as I mentioned, right outside of New York's NYU's AIA Center for Architecture. And so essentially, um, people would be able to attend events at AIA throughout the day on Saturday. We have events scheduled, I think, 12, 2, 4, and 6. And so there will be events sort of throughout the day happening in two spaces inside of AIA. And the idea is that as people are coming in and out, they have access to be able to peruse the books and that passersby um, in the neighborhood are also able to access those books and maybe be led inside to an event. There'll also be some free events happening inside at AIA that day. So the goal is really to make the festival more accessible, uh, more open to the public and more rooted in the community, actually, being able to have a presence in different parts of the village and being able to sort of offer opportunities that happen at night um, or during the day and making those both free and paid events so that there's a variety of opportunities for people to attend. Um, I think that's all that I have to share, but happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Jenny. That 
that was a very great presentation. Really appreciated. Thank you. Um, so for the second event, it's it's just just so I'm clear, and I'm sorry if you sorry sure. I didn't uh, if you didn't have the chance to prepare as much, but um, it's basically you said independent press, different representatives just out there, I guess, with stands in the curb lane on the sidewalk? Yeah, so actually, yes, thank you for asking me to clarify that. So basically that would be um, the CLMP Lit Fair. And I actually do have, now that I looked it up, I do have it in my email. I don't know if it's, um, if I send it to you right now, if you have sure. a moment to uh, sure. to share screen, okay, I'll send it to you now. Thank you. And that way we can just have a more uh, specific Great. conversation. Thank you. Great. Sorry Great. to uh, delay here. So um, it would actually be on the sidewalk. It would not actually be the, um, the actual curb or inside of the street. The okay. sidewalk outside of AIA is like kind of extra wide. And so what we figured out is how to line up tables in a way so that pedestrian traffic is not blocked on the flow of the sidewalk. And in addition, pedestrians uh, in the street or cars that are passing by would also be able to move freely without impediment. So um, essentially that would allow us to stay outdoors, but without you know having to block off a street or something like that for a couple of tables that are essentially um, there to sell books. Right. And as I was talking to you, I was uh, finding your email address. <laughs> right. um, Walking, talking, emailing all at the same time. Okay, just sent to you, William, if you're able to okay. share. Okay, it's coming through. And these are two options uh, of how the layout could go based on um, sort of what we've shared with our production team. We're working with Q&A Productions who um, have done a number of projects, for example, the World Science Fair over at Washington Square Park. Um, most recently, they did the um, Brooklyn Botanic Gardens Light festival called Lightscape, which happens in December. So they're used to working outdoors and working uh, with a multiple array of people and vendors and, and have a good relationship with SAPO and, and with community boards. And so we're really excited to be working with them this year. Great. Um, all right, I'm sharing it now. Um, now. From my perspective, this seems like a great, a really great cultural event. And I think a, a great fit, obviously, for the village. And it sounds like you've been doing it in the village for many years. Well, actually, interestingly, it started in the village and then it kind of branched out to all five boroughs. And then uh, sort of during COVID, when things went online for a year um, and we came back, we thought about how could we sort of consolidate and make things more accessible within like a walking area. And since the festival had started in the village, we thought, let's come back home to our roots and let's yeah. let's find a way to, over time, start building more relationships. We've been in touch with Village Alliance. Um, we have events happening at Joe's Pub. We have events happening at the Strand Bookstore, um, at Church of the Village, in various locations. So um, the events happening at AIA, as I mentioned, these would be the potential layouts um, of the tables. So it would just be like one, two, three, four, five. It would be 10 tables. Um, and on each one, uh, an independent press would have some of their books for sale. So you can see the AIA entrance is posted there at the top on the left above the, the purple mm -hmm. table lineup. And so you can see that would be just outside of the door. Um, and there is security posted just inside of there. Um, so there is like uh, sort of, uh, you know, if if you come into the space, you are walking through sort of a, a more formal environment into uh, AIA. But as I mentioned, there are both free and paid events happening in the space that day. Um, but it's not just sort of like an open free for all in and out. There is some degree of um, sort of accountability in the space. So, Got it. Uh, yeah, I hope that helps to answer a little bit more questions about the the second event. Definitely. Um, okay, Brian. Brian, you want to ask a question? Okay, thank you very much. Appreciated that presentation. Thank you. So, when you first started out, I I may have misheard. Um, and it's a, just a detail that um, the AIA, the Center for Architecture, is not in any way affiliated with NYU. And so I didn't want to leave that impression with any of our audience. Um, but the, the sidewalk, as you show in the diagram, it is wide when it's unencumbered, but uh, 
There is that bike rack just opposite the AIA entrance. Mm -hmm. And it seems like to me that I recall some other, you know, there's amenity space at the curb where you can have parking meters or other types of posts and signs and maybe even uh, a tree pit. Um, it, um, I hope that you've taken all that into account, but it does seem like there's, I cannot read the space left between the tables and the wall of the building. Um, thank you for bringing those concerns up. Yes, we actually did go to the sidewalk with the tape measure and uh, measured out the width uh, between the door and the wall of the building, as well as the curb, and took into account things like the bike rack and the tree stumps. And so the idea is to work in a way that is beneficial to the space and to the flow of traffic, not to impede space. That's something that is really important to me as a producer and to the production team, because we, we, we've both been in New York forever and we love the city and we love being able to have people access live events. And so we want to make sure people can do that safely and accessibly and not, not cause problems. <laughs> we want this to be something that's of benefit to all. So do you have the dimension on that diagram that I can't read the, the space? You know, I'm so sorry. I did not realize we were reviewing this one tonight. So I do not have that right in front of me. Oh, there it is. Six by oh. five, six feet by uh, five inches. And then five okay. feet by 10 inches if we set the tables moving in the other direction. So on the left, they would be horizontal in the pink. And then on the right, they would be sort of vertically aligned. Um, and if they're, you know, horizontally aligned, the space between the table and the AI entrance would be six feet, five inches. And then on the other configuration, it would be five feet, 10 inches, which would allow uh, three inches of space between the curb and those tables. So it's kind of the question of whether we want the tables right on the edge on, on the curb to sort of allow for more space internally on the sidewalk, or if we wanted to leave space on both sides of the tables. So when you're dimensioning from the tables to the curb, that's that's the actual, the riser of the curb, is that correct? And, um, then, and then you have something else uh, labeled as the curb? So basically where you see um, the bike rack, that's sort of like, I, I guess maybe that's more like six inches probably, um, maybe five. I'm trying to look at the it two. It says three feet there. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm trying to see this and also see my notes and you at the same time. Um, so three feet there and then being able to that comes right to the edge of the curb. So I'm not I'm not sure how we're defining the curb, but like the three feet is the distance between the lip or the edge of the curb and the table. All right. Well, that all makes sense. What date is that event? At this will be Saturday. Both of these events are Saturday, May 13th, and they would be happening during the day between the hours of 12 noon and 5 p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you. And when and um when you went to the site, uh, I know there was last year a scaffolding there. Has that come down now? Yes, thankfully okay. that has come down. Great. Rocio? Thank you so much for presenting today. Um, just curiosity, can you please tell us, um, give us an idea of the specific topics that will be discussed at the um, AIA um, events? Oh, what sure. type of topics? Yes, and I'm not sure if everyone can see um, what's dropped in the chat, but I could also put our um, World Voices Festival website uh, in the chat. And also just to share with those who can't see the chat, it's, uh, you can find us at worldvoices.penpen.org, O-R-G. And you can see all 40 of our events that will be held. And so if you click on all events, if you're able to go to worldvoices.pen.org, um, you can pull up events for specific venues. So I'll go right now to AIA, Center for Architecture, some of the events that will be held, um, Holocaust Legacies, Insurrection, the story of January 6th, Standing in the Shadows of History, Writing in Exile. And then in addition, in the other space in AIA, Translation Slam, 
off kilter fairy horror tales in the 21st century. And then Dreaming Out Loud, a public reading of undocumented youth, translation manifesto, and a young audience's event, writing truthfully for kids about today's issues. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Michael. Yes, a oh, quick question <clears throat> about the books. Will they be sold in both locations or are they, they're only for display? I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Uh, Astro Place, we will not be selling any books. They will only be sold in front of AIA. So people would be queuing up to look at the books in Astro Place, but they might be queuing up to buy them at AIA. Um, queuing up, I guess, maybe possibly, yeah, at, in front of AIA, but at Astro Place, the idea is that it would be this bookshelf that's open on both sides, kind of like the like if you imagine bookshelves that are a cube that don't have a, a front or a back to it, so you can kind of reach all the way through it. So the idea is that passersby on either side could take the books or the notes from the children um, and be able to read more about uh, sort of what is behind those, those banned readings. And you do not predict any congestion on the sidewalk in front of AIA? We do not because LaGuardia tends to have a little bit less foot traffic um, than say like, you know, the south end of Washington Square Park where there's so much more movement. It's because it's that side street, it's a little less, um, I think, pedestrian heavy, but it still does have a nice flow of people who are coming through for restaurants and cafes and, and going into the park. And also graduation, of course, is happening that weekend. So there's going to be a lot of families and a lot of students around. Um, but I, I don't anticipate that we're going to have you know, sort of huge crowds and and blocking the sidewalk. The goal is to um, stagger things and to ensure that people can get in and out of the space without having to, again, block anything on the sidewalk. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I don't see any more. Thank you, Jenny, for staying with us. Um, I definitely look forward to stopping by one or more of these events. Oh, excellent. Please do come say hello. Thank you very much, yes. William. And thank you everyone for, for hearing us out. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the festival. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Okay. We've got two more. Um, Village Fair and Expo. Broadway between Waverly and East 14th. Hello, Wilson. I promoted you. Hello? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, hi, how are you? Hi, greetings uh, from the Stonewall Rebellion Veterans Association uh, in our 54th year. And this will be our renewal 20th New York City Stonewall Street Fair. And I'm uh, Wilson Henderson, as I see on the screen. So this is uh, simple, we don't have there's no food trucks, no DJs, no diagrams, no alcohol, no marijuana. Okay. So this is a Mardi Gras street fair, the standard street fair with kind of their regular vendors that you see. Is that right? Uh, basically, however, um, our street fair is unique to all others, uh, besides being a nonprofit organization, is we have the famous 1969 blue convertible, which was impounded during the Stonewall Uprising on display every year. So that attracts a lot of people coming. It's promoted by Mardi Gras Productions. And so a lot of people come because the car, besides being a classic, a 1969 convertible, um, it's also famous historically. So that's a very unique feature of ours. And plus, we have an information booth to give out literature and uh, other uh, educational 
paraphernalia about the Stonewall Rebellion and, of course, about the SRVA organization. Yeah, that was going to be my next question, if there was another informational or historical aspect to it. Yes. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things that we tell basically any street fair um, that applies uh, in our district is that, you know, a multi-block fair on Broadway, we generally advise against. Is there, have you looked at other possible locations? Is there a reason it has to be on Broadway? Well, a good question. Uh, we were asked that uh, last couple of years too. The city requested us to change the street fair from where we had it in the West Village over to this location. So, uh, and um, Mardi Gras Productions has the, uh, the uh, uh, written request about this. So that's why we did it. We, we accommodated the city with this. You remember yes, when? over on Greenwich Avenue. Okay. When do you remember when about that change was? Yes, um, it's definitely four years. Four years. So we've had it at this location for four years. Okay. And at the other one, I think we were totally at the other location, probably for fifteen or sixteen years. It might have been one year where it was uh, even somewhere else. Okay. Um, I don't have any other questions. Um, <clears throat> does anybody else on have any questions? Rocio? Yes, uh, when I first uh, started reading this particular uh, application, I noticed the name of the event is Village Fair and Expo. Uh, I don't recall seeing that name before. Um, I always recall the, um, the name being Stonewall Rebellion Veterans Association. Uh, is this something new that has been, uh, something that has changed? Uh, actually, no, because the uh, what you say stated was uh, accurate, but nothing was changed because the Stonewall Rebellion Veterans Association, which, by the way, is registered with the Charities Bureau of the New York State. Um, that's the name of the organization. And then the name of the event is called Village Fair and Expo. And the name of the event is given by the uh, producers of it, not by us, although I would like to have the word Stonewall in the event for next year. And I know last year it was the same name, Village Fair and Expo. You can uh, certainly verify okay. that. Okay. And uh, also uh, as a PS, this coming Sunday in the New York Times, in fact, while I was uh, waiting this evening, I completed thir my third part of the interview. It'll be in, in the Times Sunday, as I stated. Uh, it's about the Stonewall Rebellion and one of the veterans, very well known, the boxer, Emil Griffith. I hope some of you or all of you have heard of him. He's a six time middleweight boxing champion who was gay. He's not with us anymore, but he was the vice president of SVA for a long time. So we'll be in the Sunday Times. And today, the Metropolitan Opera opened their new uh, performance called Champion, which is based on uh, Emil Griffith. Okay. Rocio has another question. Yes, um, can you tell us please how many um, vendors will be uh, at this place uh, and how much revenue is gonna be made from this particular fair and where is the money going to? Well, you- uh, I always ask you, I always ask you the I, financial questions, you know that. Yeah, you ask the same questions every year, which I don't mind. Uh, it's a little past my bedtime, but the answer is, uh, we don't know how many vendors will be there. As you know, you have to ask, not you personally, but CB2 could ask Mardi Gras Projections. We wouldn't know that. 
and we never know what amount the organization is going to get. It's not that much, I could tell you that, because you know it's divided between the city and the production company and then the sponsor. Uh, I think it's a third, a third, a third, whatever it is. And we, as always, spend the funds on promoting uh, our educational material and giving to certain other nonprofit organizations, including three churches in Greenwich Village, and also helping out indigent Stonewall veterans, or several of them, as you can imagine. So that, that's the answer, same as uh, always. Can you tell us what churches you contribute to? Yeah, uh, the one of them is Collegiate Marble, and also St. John's Lutheran on Christopher Street, and the Church of the Village at West 13th Street and 7th Avenue. Not only do we contribute, but we have uh, events at them and meetings and so forth. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other okay. questions? I don't see any other questions. So uh, thanks, Wilson, for sticking with All us. All right. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Um, so for the last event, Daria, are, Daria is still on here, but I don't know if Daria is. Oh, yes. Great. Okay. I promoted you. Hello. Hello, good evening. Hi. Sorry, it's run so late. Thank you for staying with oh, us. Okay, it's important. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, I sent over some slides to you, William. If you yeah. could close up. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Okay. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I know you guys heard from my colleague, Josh, earlier, um, same company, RMNG, but this time we are working with our client, Kristen S., which is a hair care line. They have a lot of products that are stocked nationwide. I'm sure some people have seen them before, but they're really great. Um, for this program, you can move on to the next slide. The goal is to, um, Sorry, William, could you go to the next slide? <laughs> Thanks. Um, Chris and S just wants to promote Mother's Day and just do a nice give back to the community. So we're, they're gonna be doing that by surprising the public with floral bouquets and celebrating Mother's Day. To do that, we're going to be utilizing a branded food truck, um, which is on the next slide, you can see the truck. This is not what the truck wrap will be. We don't quite have that yet, but this is the type of truck, just like a vintage mo um, truck. It'll pull up on the sidewalk for the location that we are talking about today. And what will happen is there will be three brand ambassadors from Kristen S that'll be engaging with the members of the public that are just walking by and whatnot and saying, hey, this is what we're doing, talking about the hair care line. And then in order to receive a floral bouquet, they would need to scan a QR code and which would take them to the Kristen S Instagram page, give it a follow, and then they would be able to receive a bouquet. The bouquets are quite elegant to stay on theme with the Kristen S brand, lots of pastels and florals with a silk bow. Just a nice gift to say thanks for celebrating Mother's Day with us. And then moving on to the location on the next slides. So we are talking about the Southeast corner of Broadway and Houston. Um, truthfully, anywhere between um, Broadway, or excuse me, between Houston and the next block over Col Colsette, we would be great with, um, but ideally we're on right on that corner, kind of in front of like the American Eagle. And then this is also our schedule. So we would, this would be happening on Saturday, May 13th. We would load in from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. And by load in, it's really just pulling up the truck and getting our brand ambassadors ready. The event would take place from 12 to four. We have about 200 bouquets to give away. So just as long as that takes and then loading out the truck pulling away from four to five. And that's basically our event. I'm happy to answer any questions. It's a pretty simple. We just want to 
celebrate with flowers. <laughs> Sorry, I was on mute. Thank, uh, okay, thank you, Daria. Um, can you just maybe tell, just very briefly tell us a little bit more about the company you're working with, Kristen S. I'm not that familiar. Yeah, so they're a hair care line. They do like shampoos, um, dry shampoo. They have another product that you can make your hair pink for the day and it washes out. Um, just really like they're an upscale hair company. Okay. So they'll just be engaging with the public, talking about the products, and then also offering the bouquets in exchange for the Instagram follow. Gotcha. And is there any any amplified sound? Nope. The truck might have a speaker on it, but it would no, not be loud. And if that's an issue, we could also just not have the sound. But it would just be playing um, clean pop hits from Spotify. Okay. And no 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 food it's a food truck but you're just giving away Correct. just flowers. giving away flowers there's no food involved great um brian okay thanks uh could you go back to the location of the truck because it's not clear to me which uh, location it's going to be located at that's a very busy intersection right so um I mean, it's open to whatever I'm open to your guys' feedback as well. Ideally, it's right in front of the American Eagle in order to be right on the southeast corner of Broadway in Houston. But if it needs to be anywhere along the block moving east, that's fine as well. Okay, well, Broadway is a one-way street. The house then is uh, otherwise. Um, so the photograph, that's... Yeah, just I, that's the southwest corner, I think. Yeah, that is the south. So apologies. Um, well, we would be going for the southeast corner. So apologies if the photo is incorrect. Yeah, that the south southeast where the, where the pink the star very, is. Okay, the pink star. Yes, that's a very very uh, busy and crowded uh, sidewalk and uh, street. Uh, it's that that would not be a good location, I don't think. Uh, I just don't. I'm not even. Not even. I mean, sure we are aiming to engage with members of the public, so we do want to be in a somewhat foot traffic heavy location so that we can engage. If I'm not mistaken. There's a there's a vendor a, a newsstand uh, at that corner now. Um, I'm not sure about any parking. There's a, a very busy subway exit right there subway exit that's right um anyway so I, I would like i would certainly like to see more study done of that location of a location so i'll, I'll just i guess I'll, I'll leave it at that great well we're happy to look at the different corners um on that intersection and see if there's something that would work better If you're trying to avoid people coming, you know, the huge crowds that come out of the subway, moving further east, I would guess might be a little better towards Crosby. Okay. Um, but uh, Pete also has his hand raised. He might have a suggestion. So, Pete, do you want to chime in? Sure. Um, about eight years ago, when this building was built, part of the agreement with the neighborhood was to widen that sidewalk because it was so crowded and it's still very, very crowded. Um, it's not a good location, that entire block front. And the problem is you get to the next block where uh, the subway station comes up there. So from Lafayette to Broadway, it's, uh, it's problematic for creating a situation where people would be queuing up gotcha so the engagement with the pub or with from the brand ambassadors to the public would be pretty quick so we are, um, are planning on having a quick flow in terms of coming up to the truck so you want to come to the neighborhood because it's so crowded you said that and you what you will do i'm sorry but what this will do is create more congestion where there's already congestion and i don't think it's a good idea Thank you. Okay, just to address that, happy to move further east down towards Crosby as we discussed as well. 
Um, I'm sorry you weren't listening. Um, it's from Lafayette to Broadway where it's really crowded. Thank you. Okay, uh, Laura. Hi again. Um, yeah, this is Mother's Day and living in Soho, I'm very aware of what Mother's Day is like. It's incredibly busy si sidewalks. We have had an issue with other flower giveaways, which I am sure will be happening without even coming through um, this, this um, committee because they haven't before, but the streets are incredibly busy. Um, and as Pete, and I won't repeat what Pete said, but he's right. Um, for the applicant, A, it's Houston Street, not Houston Street. And Crosby Street, which Pete mentioned, is the street in between Lafayette and Broadway. Um, part of the problem that we're seeing with several of the applicants here is that they have absolutely no knowledge of the communities that they're coming into. And um, that's an issue. Uh, it's, it's not to the public benefit to have 200 flowers being given away on Mother's Day in our community. Um, we're just too busy, thank you. Just one small correction that it would be the day before Mother's Day. I hear what you're saying. Otherwise, I'm just noting that it's the day before Mother's Day. Yeah, but it's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't see any other hands raised. So um i think we'll call it there thank you daria thank you okay have a good night okay um we made it through i know it's getting later let's go back through um so we're going into business session now. So at this point, um, we'll keep it to the committee discussion. Um, so let's just go back through an order. Um, 420 street closure events, the first one. Um, for me, uh, if we can't get them to agree to not have any live performance, I'm just not comfortable with the safety aspect of this. That's my biggest concern, because even if even if the performer is not using social media themselves, we know how quickly things can spread over social media. I went and toured this area. It's a very tight block. Um, I don't think it's a risk that we would want to allow anyone to take. Um, so I'm I'm not really on board with this one. I'm happy to hear what other people think. Um, you know, I, I also took the tour with you and I have to say the pos the very po real possibility of some sort of a surge scares me. Um, I don't think, I mean, even if this happens, I don't think we in good conscience should be encouraging events that make this possible. I agree. I was trying to make the point with the rhetorical question I was asking them, which is basically, is this really how you want to start off your introduction to the neighborhood, right? If you're trying to provide something that's educational. Um, it, it, they could have done something lower key that I think people would have been okay with. Um, I don't well, know. My, my problem is they're a business, not a museum, and therefore they don't want to do anything low key. That's the impression yep. I got. Yeah. It also were, yeah, that uh, joined you on the tour. And we did talk about, well, what happens if some live performer is there, the, the, new, the word gets out, the surge happens, then 
you would have to shut down the whole uh, street fair. And that would cause even more uh, turmoil and pushback and who knows what else, uh, because people would have come expecting to see a performance or see a some star. And um, yeah, it's as you said, this is this is a dangerous uh, kind of a thing to be planning for, and because anything can happen, it's it's very difficult to plan for what may happen. So I think it's yeah. Risky. You can't really be wishy washy on whether someone really famous is going to show up and not disclose exactly who that person is. I mean, that's something that has to be really someone well planned will disclose for. it without a doubt. He's the whole no you cannot get you they cannot remain anonymous that's like yeah. a given yeah. rocio yeah i uh i'm not in favor of this um as you probably can tell <clears throat> i agree this is not the way to introduce the community to this event if they really want it as i mentioned before they should do it in their building and they should have people that have tickets that are free if that's what they want but inside and not necessarily in our streets and our sidewalks and yes we don't know what's going to happen if they do have someone show up uh, when they opened the dispensary over on Leaker street about a month and a half ago the lines were going down the block i could barely get down the street imagine what this would be like if they have performers if they have anything like that and yep. so i uh, would definitely vote against this because i think safety is number one and we have to be concerned about that and if we don't feel that this is going to be a safe event because so many people you know what happens when a lot of people get together and it could get out of control we cannot i will not support this thank you yeah Thank you, Rocio. Joanna? Uh, yeah, just a quick clarification question, and maybe you all got a better sense on the tour. When they said live performance, are they talking about someone intentionally who has a very large following for this event? Because at first I got the impression that it's just a live performer, but um, are we expecting that this is someone who would likely draw like thousands of people? So in the application, they put, I think, Travis Scott, or uh, someone of that stature. Then uh, when we talked to them on the tour, then they said Sheck Wes, who still has a million plus followers on Instagram. Um, and now they, they're not disclosing who. So it's kind of, okay. a, it's kind of scary. Thanks. Yeah. Susan? Um, yeah, I want to point out that, you know, and, and, and Will, you had commented on this, how the short, you know, we are commenting and we're going to uh, produce a rezo on something that, you know, we're not even going, our, our input is not even really going to be heard because it's not coming up for a vote until the board meeting on the 20th and that's the day of the event. And, you know, our role as, as you know, responsible and, and, and our, and, and our concerns about safety and you know the community. I mean, this whole thing is it's it's kind of it's it's kind of a joke because it's like you know where who are we talking to? And this is just you know I hope you know nothing goes wrong. That it's like who's going to listen to us if, if 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 these kind of things keep happening when we aren't you know the the, the timing makes it impossible for our concerns yeah. to even get anywhere. Yeah, this is exactly the kind of thing where I think community input is most needed because you're dealing with a potentially dangerous situation. Um, and uh, that's why I commented even that this should not have been a large street event. This should have been an extra large, which would have been 60 days notice. Um, and they didn't even give the 45. So, uh, you know, I, I, I flagged this to SAPO already. Um, I know it's not an official resolution that we've passed. Um, what we'll do and what we've done in the past is 
I'll write the resolution for this like right away and we'll send it to SAPO just because we don't have time to wait for full board. So we'll note that it's not an official CB2 resolution, but we'll pass our comments and the comments of the members of the public as well. And we'll incorporate that and send it to them. And that's all that's, I think, you know, we'll put in the strongest possible terms, our concerns and send it to them. I would agree because we need to be on record. Exactly. Yeah. That's just what I was going to say. I mean, we have to say it's not an official CB2 resolution, right. but I look, I, I, they're used to working with us at this point. So. I, right. No, we, as long as we label it correctly, but the point is, is that we, you know, we have, we have to do what we can do. Agreed. Carter. Yeah. I, I just wanted to add additionally, we don't, you know, there's, they did not provide us with any, uh, background on any of the rules, you know, as far as, you know, one of the things that we've spoken about is su supporting the new framework that New York State has put out for the legalization of cannabis. And there's no framework within this of how they want to do this. And they're taking a date that is typically celebrated as a counterculture to push for legalization, trying to co-opt it as part of you know, the beginning of their for-profit endeavor without really understanding what are the rules to doing an event like this. And in New York, while you can, you know, sm you can smoke cannabis wherever you smoke cigarettes, I think that once you start having organized events, and I don't, I, I'm not sure where these rules are, but I know if you did a event just for smoking cigarettes, where everybody just started smoking at once in a public assembly environment, you know, that is most likely not legal because that sort of runs counter, I believe, to the, um, to some of the Clean Air Act, which I think is indoors, but also covers public assembly for outdoors. But without knowing anything on there, they weren't truthful. You can just see from the Instagram posts, you know, as far as they said, oh, no, nobody ever smokes inside of our place. And you've got Cheech and Chong smoking inside there and you've got Mr. Frey walking with them in the museum when, you know, he specifically said, no, we don't do that. Um, and, you know, the point is, we it's not that they don't do this, but we don't know what the regulations are. And once you take control of a space and you regulate it and you're having an event that's under your security guards, that is within your perimeters that you take control, it's not the New York City Police Department or anybody else, you are, you are enforcing it. You know, there's no guidance on that. There's no thought to that. We didn't hear anything about it. And it's okay to do it once that's figured out, whatever the rules are, but the rules aren't there. And that coupled with everything else just adds, I think, another element. And they didn't seem interested in finding it out. And that's that's more of my concern because a part of putting your right foot forward is trying to to you know work with the spirit of the new regulations that have been passed and advocating for it to happen. So I I just, I, I, it's a little different take on what others have said, but I think that's important. And, you know, as home to half of the licensed cannabis dispensaries right now in New York state, I think, I believe that there's six that have opened, you know, it's incumbent, incumbent upon us to, to further the goals of New York state's legalization um, efforts and, uh, and not promote just sort of you know, whatever you want to do, which which is clearly uh, creating a lot of problems, um, you know, within New York City. Thanks. Thank you, Carter. Yeah, I, that's something I want to dig into more because I I was skimming through the SAPO handbook trying to find specifics on smoking and looking at the public assembly rules. And it's, it's something that we should probably drill down on a bit more as a committee. Um, and so I thank you for raising that. And, and one more thing is... Yeah. You know, it's not hard to drag over enough people from Washington Square Park or Union Square to overwhelm this event yeah. in a heartbeat during the day. And I think that that just speaks to what Susan was saying, you know, is do we want to not uh, be connected with, you know, an overrun situation or as, as you had pointed out well. So I think those yep. are. Yep, yep. Um. Okay, any other comments, points to be made? Um, is anyone gonna, uh, is anyone against our, the concept of denying this? Okay, let's go ahead and vote. Uh, all, in, all in favor of a denial, say aye. 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 
Uh, any opposed? Any opposed? Any abstain? Okay. And I know for plaza events, you can't smoke. I'm, I'd like to have specific clarification on a street event outside of a plaza. So oh, something for us to dig into. David's um, just posted in the chat. Specific. Okay. Yeah, yeah. plazas, parks, I know though that's quite clear. Right. We should just drill down in the, in the actual street activity language as well. Um, but something for a, a, a different time. Let's, let's move to um, the second one, Malin and Getz. Um, to me, I'm, I'm generally okay with this. It's very low impact. It's a small food cart. Um, they do have a location in CB2, which I know we like to see. Um, although the event's not in front of the location, but, um, I'm, I'm generally okay with this one. Anyone disagree? I agree. Okay. All in favor? of approval for the Mellon and Guts event. Say aye. 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 Great. Any opposed? Any abstain or recuse? Okay. Um Amazon food food truck um freebie. I definitely appreciated the very detailed presentation. Um, I know Rocio uh, made a valid point about local businesses. Um, it seemed they were willing to do some stuff to address the, some of the concerns, uh, such as what Darlene had raised about cannibalizing business. Um, Valerie made a good point about uh, the value of these types of uh, activations and how they're they're very targeted. Um, I think I'm okay if we just note the fact that they were willing to work with the local blocks uh, to minimize the impact and he even offered to provide compensation. So we can note that in there um, and then ask SAPO just to, to, to drill down on that point. It's the first time I've heard anyone offer compensation. That's uh, right. That's right. <laughs> I was going to say that. I, I've never heard anybody. I said, well, thank God he's very kind and generous. Uh, so I think they showed they're very willing to work to address those concerns. And otherwise it's it's one day and it's only a couple hours in each space. So it's very fairly low impact. So I would generally be in favor. We vote. Does anyone disagree? I don't wanna I don't want to just dominate the whole conversation. <laughs> no, we can vote. Okay. All, all in favor. Say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Any abstain or recuse? <laughs> no, don't see anybody. Okay. I wish I could have uh, recused myself if I was owner of Amazon. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Where were we? Valentino. Just give me a second here. I, I have I have like 20 pages of typed notes to go back and I get lost now. Is Valentino next? Yes, Valentino. Any comments on this? No, it seems doable. I mean, it did. We approved this before, a variation before, right? Yeah, we, uh, we approved the last double-decker bus. I, I think... It seems like they'll have someone on site. I think the only real concern was the DJ on the roof. And it seems like if someone has a problem with that, they can we can walk over and they'll turn it down. If they were responsive that the first time, that's a good thing. Yeah. Is anyone opposed to this? No. Okay, let's vote. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstain, recuse. Okay, we're unanimous. Um, okay, I have next the Coach Tabby tour. 
Um, we're back to the plaza. Um, I think we should, I think I would kind of lean towards doing what we did last time, which was just continuing to show disapproval of commercial plaza events while noting this one has certain mitigating factors. Um, if you think about our, our matrix that we've used, this is not taking up a huge amount of the plaza. It's leaving some seating. It's a small display, but it's still basically advertising. There's not much of a additional cultural um, aspect to it, I think. Is this the handbag? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, there's no community connection. Um, I guess, although not in meatpacking, um, they do have a store, I think, in CB2. So I don't know if that mitigates it, but it's they, they do have some presence in the district uh, in Soho, I believe. Yep. Um, well, how do others feel? I'm a little concerned about those power generators uh, running all day. And uh, it's just very unfortunate that they are exceeding the the power cap capability of uh, a plug-in for electric power. Um, yeah. geez, I don't know. The, these, these things are bad enough at uh, vendors and to set one up on the, the public plaza and have it run all day, that's, uh, that's very unfortunate. Uh, so I'm not too pleased with that. I think we've established kind of a record of just opposed, generally opposing cult commercial events, unless we find there's like a real educational or cultural value. Right. Um, so for me, this would just sort of fall into that, um, into that category. Does anyone disagree? I think that's right. I think we should be, you know, consistent in our policies. Um, we thought we discussed this at length. So their store is on Prince Street, by the way. Yeah. And I think Kate Spade has a store too, which is the same company. Um, since we know in practice, these often still get approved. Um, is, is there anything we want to say in terms of recommendations for if it does get approved? We should maybe mention what Brian just brought up in terms of being, you know, good citizens and, you know, not using, you know, polluting know. generators like that. Maybe it, you know, that's something to consider. Yeah. Then we won't, won't get free ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's um, a worthwhile trade off, though. I trade air for ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> Very okay. tight. Ice cream too. We can maybe ask the load in to be pushed back too, because they said 5 a.m. for the they were gonna first start pulling up, which seems early to me. You're right. I agree. Okay. Yeah. Um anyone else? Any other discussion? So I'm gonna propose that we issue denial with commentary. All in favor of that, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain or recuse? Okay. Great. Um, neighborhood sidewalk sale. I don't. I don't think anyone would have an issue with that one. Um, all in favor? Say aye. 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 All opposed, abstain, recuse. Okay. Um, okay, SHM. This is an interesting one. Um, <laughs> I don't. Yeah. Other, part of my issue is I, I. I don't. I'm not as familiar with the organization, so I'm, I'm trying to do some research on them. Um, I'm trying to figure out why they chose this location. Yeah, they don't have a physical location, they said. So, so I guess of all it's... places, why, why there and not someplace else? Yeah. Um, 
Um, well, so maybe, it seems like a yeah. Maybe it was the uh, they they arranged for that space at Fifty Bond, and it's an open street, as uh, Carter was mentioning. Um, there may be some things they haven't quite worked out, but they seem to be very flexible. And so actually, you know, once, once they establish the use of 50 bond and it's an open street, don't, doesn't that automate, doesn't that give them some claim to the use of the street? Not, not totally, but within this application. So it seems like um, maybe those things go together. Well, I, th I think the open street sponsored by Il Buco though, 50 bonds, just a vacant storefront, right? Or is that not what you're saying? Are you saying that one restaurant on a block could sponsor or somehow control a whole street? Well, there's typically like one or two restaurants who will sponsor it and then they'll sort of set it up and be the main con point of contact for the city. And then others, of course, can use it. Okay. Um, so, which I'd have to double check, I, but I, I, guess, I think that's what's, well, what's that's happening. Okay, so, the bond is currently vacant. So Yes, Il Buco has, has, is working with this group and with 50 bond, whoever the landlord is. Yeah. Um, look, I mean, from what I can see about the organization, it seems like it, it is a you know, good cultural organization. It has a historical aspect and a cultural aspect to it. The choice is kind of random of, of where to do it, um, but it's not a commercial event. Um, I don't think I would be in favor of sort of an outright denial, but maybe we could have something that is sort of a approved with conditions uh, if we wanted to address some of the concerns about sound um, and stuff like that. It's a, how long is it? Five hour event. Zach? Yeah, mm -hmm. I would I would say say the we say the location is somewhat random and it is, but if they don't have a physical location anywhere is really random for them. And I think picking a place where the street is already shut down as that stretch of bond is basically it is every weekend, there's probably less disruption than if they were already gonna ask to shut down a street that is open normally. <laughs> Carter? Yes, sir. I, I was just double checking and I, for the open streets, so the open streets, it's closed every day of, you know, in the evenings from 4.30 or 5 through through um, 11. The building with the vacant storefront um, is owned by the same founder of the entity that's using the vacant storefront. Um, so they're, it's basically, they're just using a vacant storefront that they already own. Ah, organization. So that's um, why they chose the location. <laughs> right. It's a Thor equities property and, and the, it's also the founder of Thor equities is the founder of, of the organization that's sponsoring the event. But I mean, taking over streets, having DJs for a private entity and closing off the event to people is sort of the antithesis of what, you know, we do and and it's one thing if it's open to the public but it's specifically not and so if it's full with whoever the participants are it's closed you know to anybody and the renderings that they provided if you if you try to calculate out 4000 square feet it's a pretty significant area um that will be closed with a 40 foot wide street and you know, and just sort of moving around the fire lanes, et cetera. I mean, it's a ticketed private event with food. You know, it's, it says they're right on the um, on the application. They're using it to solicit monies for other things. I mean, this is just another um, sort of imposition on the local community, I think, you know, that's not for any benefit or anything for the people who live on the block. They're just coming and closing off and privatizing a portion of the block, even though it, it is a museum, it's not a, you know, it's not a comment on the endeavors of the museum, but it's not really for anybody there. And I, you know, if we start doing this everywhere and people are closing down streets, I mean, that's, you know, where you can't walk down the street 
and and be in there or just participate uh, is problematic. And I I you know I noticed that that one of the the um, the principles of one of the local block associations was on the meeting, but you know uncharacteristically was silence. You know, with this, and and you know the the impacts can't be um, overstated on the music side of things, and and the, that type of um, event. There's a reason sound permits are not handed out, particularly frequently by the precincts, and that's because of the the impacts. And when you have a closed event, it's even more of an issue. So it's as soon as I heard it was closed. And that they're expecting, you know, a large number of people to come through there. It does say that they're serving alcohol, but then they said there's a bar that it's not. It's sort of unclear, but it's clearly food. It's not really for sale. It's for the people who are going there. But it's oh, we'll open it later. I mean, these are all just elements that are, I think, a concern. Um, generally speaking, when you close a street off, um, so thanks. I particularly asked them what was the relationship between that 50 Bond Street, and they didn't tell us what we just found out from Carter's research. So why? Why didn't they tell us what the connection was? And I think that the fact that Ilbuco um, is oh, sponsoring this thing is it's always great for their business. But what does it do for, to the rest of the community? Everything that Carter says, I agree with. Once they said that it was going to be a closed event, I think uh, I would not support this. I like the cultural aspect. I like that. But I think this is more of a win-win for certain entities that are sponsoring this event. And I will uh, not support it. Hmm. What do others think? Do do people want to do people just want to deny it? Do people want to uh, say that it would have to be a, a truly public event for us to support it? I guess we could say both. But that's not what they presented. Yeah. Yes, Joanna. Can we offer like an in between where anything that's on the street space is public use, but if they have anything that's held in the vacant storefront, they can have a RSVP list for that? Maybe, but yeah, I mean, that's not what they put forth, but that that's an interesting idea. What date is the event, I forgot? It is- 4 p.m. Uh, and... No, the date. <clears throat> the 13th. 13th and 14th. So do, uh, do we have time to make recommendations for change? Yeah, Typically, I mean, maybe. But there's not a lot of time. Yeah. Oh. Susan, Susan, did you have a comment? Oh, I was going to say that, you know, one of the reasons we give a lot of leeway to cultural um, groups is because they're sharing their culture with the community and because they're inviting people to learn and, and, and to become, you know, for the experience of this, of the culture that a group is sharing. But it seems like this event is kind of doing the opposite of that. It's like, they're not sharing their, if, I mean, if this was an event that was open and they were, you know, presenting different things that people could come and experience, you know, and examine, that would be a, a no brainer. This is looks like sounds like a party more that they're celebrating themselves, and that okay people could come in, but it's not geared towards the sharing experience that we value. Right. Yeah. Yeah, like if it was just if it was a street fair where they were showcasing some of the artifacts and the items that. Uh, they had in their collection. I think that would be really valuable. Um, yeah, I mean, it seems like a private party that they want to have on a public street. Yeah. Anything else, Tad? No. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I just offer a small counterpoint um, on the idea of open to the public. I mean, it's a fundraiser. So people buy tickets and they attend the event. Well, they said so it's I, free. They said it's oh, free to it's attend. Free. Yeah, you get a ticket, you attend. I mean, we talk about Il Buco and Fish Cheeks who have a huge portion of the street. You can't just walk into those if there's a table. If you have a reservation, you can, if you spend money on dinner. But it's not like they're putting up cultural exhibits on Bond Street. And we don't object to that. And then nobody really objects to it, I think. So I think we're drawing a distinction here that's a little bit, a little bit disingenuous. But secondly, if they own 50 Bond, Let's say they had 50 Bond was a restaurant. Would we tell them they couldn't have the same outdoor dining that Il Buco or Fish Cheeks does? I mean, it is a place that they own, whether it's vacant or not, and whether it's Thor Equities or not, it's the same person, it's the same ownership. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, I understand there's a distinction that's being drawn. I, I think we're being a little bit too bright line on it. My two cents. One thing I would say that if we're going, if we do support it, we really, sh we should mention things like the, the noise, the, the music, you know, it, you know, things that are going to keep this um, as, you know, annoyance free as, as possible. So, so the that, that music point was something. Yep, a lot of I think we also need to say if we're going to support it, uh, that we're in favor of cultural institutions, but we have problems with this event. I, I think we can open we can open the door uh, to right. many more parties like this, private parties. And I think that we're going to set the wrong precedent. So we have to be careful. We have to be very careful how we phrase yeah. this. I think we I think we say we don't support it as as the app as currently applied. And then we can have commentary saying, you know. We'd love to see them come here as and share, you know, the cultural their culture with us. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. I got to think a little bit about how to word this, but basically. So it's sort of a deny as is with suggestions as to maybe how we could support an event by that same applicant, if that makes sense. I don't know if we're finessing it too much, but what do people think about that? Yes, Carter? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, open streets and open restaurants were specifically uh, designed to help an industry. And this is a, just a continuation of the temporary programs for that, you know, hosting and closing streets just to this happens to be an open street. But if you start moving down the path where you start closing off stuff everywhere for private events, you basically end up with um, closed streets for private events, no matter what they are. And, and, and it's a very different. I mean, it's easy to, to, to say they're similar, but they're not at all. Uh, similar because it's still a full street closure. The open street is not a full street closure here. There is light movement through the street. There's a parking garage that's on the street. The parking garage is not closed. People are allowed to move through the street on a regular basis, albeit it's at five miles an hour. So, you know, and that's something that El Buco and Fish Cheeks, which were both impacted by this, it's also a cobblestone street, you know, where, where you putting out tables and chairs is a difficult endeavor um, to do. It's something you have to sort of go around and, and, and place around those types of things. So there's a little bit more going on than just sort of connecting those two events. And I, I think that it opens the door to a whole lot of stuff. And there's, there's not really a nexus um, to the organization, except that a founder of a nonprofit happens to also own a building on the street that is not actually a nexus to the group to this physical location um it, it it's easy to say that but it's actually not a, uh, a a local nexus and they don't have a physical location 
either. Um, and, you know, if we start having that, that connection, we'll start having events, you know, throughout our neighborhood, throughout areas where people own homes, you know, closing streets to, to have um, uh, <laughs> events. And, you know, I mean, it's just what it is, but that's, it, it, you know, that's a, it's a, it's something that when we talk about closing streets where the events are closed off to people, we really need to, I, I think, take account of. I mean, there are very few events on closed streets that are private that I, I, I can't think of any off the top of my head. I'm sure that they've occurred, but, you know, that are ticketed events. And whether the tickets are free or not, they're not free. You know, they come with a connection to something. They may not be be paid tickets, but they're, you know, if you're a member of that organization or whatever it may be, that's that's how you get the tickets. It's not open to the general public for tickets. And then on top of that, I don't think that there was any outreach on the block or any anything that you know anybody has seen about the the impacts of the overall event. And I had forgotten about the garage, which is which means that's not just an emergency lane. It's actually going to be used throughout the event uh, because the garage is not closed. Um, during that and, and people do have access to it. Okay. I would like to, I would propose that we do a denial, but with, uh, we don't maybe usually do this, but maybe with an, in, with an invitation to come back and perhaps present something that's like an educational event about their organization somewhere in the district because I don't want it to be seen in any way that we're dismissing the cultural value of their organization as a whole. And so I just want to make sure it's worded in such a way that we're showing that. I mean, this is an unusual situation. It's not yeah. something we regularly see. So it is, it is something that you have to sort of step through carefully. Mm -hmm. Would people be on board with, I mean, you have to see the exact wording and I'll send, I'll try to draft something up, but um, something more. like, uh, I don't even, I have to think about it, but. <laughs> I think we know you cover, you cover our key points, which was more openness to the public, uh, focus on the culture, um, DJ and sound levels, which was, I think for me, that was the biggest problem with the application in a lot of ways. Um, but those, I think those are the big three points we, we kept talking about, unless I missed something. Okay. Well, I'll give everyone a chance to read through how it reads and, but or, or let's vote on that concept of a, of a resolution. So all in favor of that, say aye. Aye. Uh, Any opposed? Any abstain, recuse? Okay. Um, okay, Penn World Voices Festival. To me, this sounds, I, I, it sounds like a really great event. Um, great organization. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, I don't know if we want to say, uh, so I think the Astro Plaza thing to me is very straightforward. I don't know if we want to say anything about the taking up the sidewalk, Brian, in front of AIA. Yeah, that's problematic. I, I would like to support this event. I, I, would, I would say they need to reduce the tables in front of the AIA in half so that you could keep the sidewalk open and not crowd the curb. I think they're trying to put too much in there. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that there's room inside for more accommodation for their, what, what they're trying to do. Yeah. So why, how about an approval with specific suggestions on the point about moving some of that inside um, and, and just ensuring that there's a fewer number of tables to allow people to pass by on the sidewalk? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. I'm okay with that. What's that, Rocio? I'm okay with that, yes. Okay. I, I think Brian has an excellent suggestion and I think we should, um, 
Agree. All right, all, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Abstain, recuse. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Stonewall Rebellion. This one we have every year. <laughs> uh, every year we vote against it. <laughs> <laughs> For 22 years I've been on the board, we voted against it every time he came. <laughs> but the city always approves it. You know, even well, if we approve, even if we, it's not about the organization, that location. Yeah. That's another point. The location okay. alone is the reason. Our, our resolutions in the past, we, we have it. Uh, we shouldn't try to judge the organization, but we've always just mentioned the location. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I think, we don't pass judgment on them. We just, yeah. but our location is really undermines the goals of how we are. Okay. Haven't we also in, in our resolutions doubted where their contributions go, or have we not touched that? I don't recall. In the 2021 one, it was just a location. I have to maybe I have to pull up the 2022 one. In any case, I can model it off of what we've said in the past if people are okay with that. Good. Yeah, I noticed that last weekend the the same stretch of Broadway was closed for another street fair. And yep. It's a total mess. It's uh, awful. But I think we we said the same thing about whatever that application was for that uh, particular event. And it's Anything still on Broadway, we always, that's multi-block, we always deny, regardless of who the organization is. I think we should continue to deny that, even though it <laughs> doesn't uh, affect it. Yeah. Carter? I, I was going to say, I think that the financials have been asked for many running years. I, I believe Rocio has asked for them. I, I, have we ever seen them? I just, I, I don't know who, who's been on the committee or how long, but I, that's been the open question. Uh, no, he, he always comes. Them. Yeah, he always comes. He used to come when we were in person with letters from the elected officials, where he used to send invitations to go to the event, one of his events. And uh, as a matter of fact, he now says that he's listed with the charities uh, organization, New York State or IRS. I'm not sure what it is. I think it's New York State. But when he, he didn't really have any, uh, at the beginning, he didn't have any formal documentation that he was uh, a valid organization with the charities of New York State. Uh, then I think as a result of our questioning him, he decided to kind of clean up his act and then he might have received some information. We don't know if it's current, um, but I remember I've been on this committee for many, many, many years. And um, there were a lot of questions about how legitimate it was, whether the car was, uh, the car that he claims was part of the revolt actually was made year after the event happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there were things like that that were brought into question for many years. So I, I don't know what the reality is, but um, yeah. I did question him for many years about where does he give the money to? Because for um, the committee members, we always felt that this was a fundraiser for his pocket and that he wasn't really doing much for the community at that time. So I don't know. Now he gave us three names of three churches because I asked him. Um, but he knows that I'm always going to ask him questions about that. And um, yeah. but he always gets approved. So but I get By Sabo, it yeah. is our, res <laughs> our responsibility to ask questions yeah. and uh, see how you know we feel about it. Uh, I had never supported this applicant, uh, this application. Um, because things didn't just seem to be um, to add up. Let's just yeah. put it that way. Yeah, but I mean, I I go to the uh, the IRS non tax exempt organization search, and they they don't show up under there. So there's no 990. I don't see a char 500 with the state of New York. So I, 
Yeah, he would be registered if he was with and his and his financials will be a matter of public record. Yeah, if you're if you're a non if you're an exempt organization, you have to file a 990 with the IRS. So yeah, I just um, asked because I the institutional memory for Rocio sharing is important because I think as we keep going year year to year, it's a little less controversial because everybody says, okay, this is what happens, but that the historical aspect of when this was a larger contextual discussion at the committee is important. I think that, you know, we heard today there's an article coming out as well, right? You know, these are all parts of of the pieces of the story. I think the Times did a story on him as well in the past about just this very issue a number of years ago. Yeah. Okay. Um, all in favor of our denial, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstain, recuse. Okay. So I think we're unanimous on everything so far. One to go. <laughs> um, I didn't miss anything right yet. We're on the last one. Kristen S. Um, branded food truck. Giving out flowers. <laughs> yeah, no food. I don't want to oppose giving flowers for Mother's Day, but we have the location. <laughs> I don't want to be on record opposing that. <laughs> um, maybe, I mean, maybe you just ask them to move to Crosby. Didn't they say they were okay with it's just I think that Crosby is still an issue, but yeah. yeah. I don't know. I think it's the location. I think we should deny it due to the location. Can we just say deny unless unless they find a more fitting location, something like that? But will we have an opportunity to find whether the fitting location is actually fitting to our standards? Well, SAPO should, well, maybe SAPO doesn't know. Um, and this is gonna take event, uh, gonna set up on May 14th. It's the 13th though. No, the application was wrong. Oh, they said the they changed it to the 13th. They changed it to the 13th. Oh. So still, do we have enough time? I mean. Well. Well, we could also, you know, uh, recommend approval, but also with the suggestion. I mean, we, this way we're not anti-Mother's Day, but we do can acknowledge that they're, they should, we could, you know, consider a, a Better. What we've done in the past before is an approval provided that it moves to a more fitting location, and then we can suggest locations if we want. I don't know if we want to do that. Mm -hmm. well, do we, we have any ideas for alternative locations? Well, from the times I've been there, the southwest location, it's, uh, you know, there's there's a there's a better parking spot or parking lane. I think there's a bulb at uh, Broadway, so it separates that out. Uh, it's not so busy. It's not as it's not where the subways are and the, the Broadway traffic doesn't necessarily go down towards the west uh, along Houston. The so, west would be a little better. I agree. I think I think maybe if they moved north of Houston somewhere along Lafayette, it gets a lot better. I don't know what others think. Yeah, there's a um, there's a bike lane on Lafayette. Yeah, um, it'd have to be on the east side. Yeah. That would be a, another alternative. All right, I would do the approve provided that it moves. To a better location i that to me sounds good i don't know if anyone disagrees and we I, can put I, those suggestions I agree. I agree i agree also okay um all in favor of that say aye uh, aye any opposed any abstain recusal yeah brian maybe just email me if that Oh, well, no, you were just saying Southwest Corner. I, I think Lafayette would be even better, but we can provide some alternatives. Okay. Um, I think we're there.
Thanks, everybody. This is a long one. Does anyone have, have any suggestions while we're here about the use of time? Um, do people feel I could be more efficient anyway? Maybe we can talk about it another time because it's 1030. For the well, I think you had no choice. You had to give everyone the time they needed. And I congratulate you for tonight's meeting. All right. If you have any suggestions, you can email me. Uh, <laughs> Separately. Well, yeah, I think you had so many applications. It, yeah. It's, and I think you handled it well. You had to give the the first one took over an hour yeah. and uh, and it had to because it was a very important one yeah. that. Uh, anyway, but I, I think the rest just went the way they were supposed to go. I, I have no suggestion. I think you did a great job and I appreciate that. All right. Although it I haven't had dinner or lunch yet, but that's OK. <laughs> yeah, I haven't had dinner either. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank right. you. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.